Well, good morning and welcome to the fifth meeting of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee for 2018. Um, I have apologies from Andy Whiteman, um, who is not present due to um, other committee business. Uh, we'll start with uh, item one on the agenda, which is a decision by the committee to take items three and four in private. Has the committee agreed? Yes. Thank you. And today we continue with our inquiry into Scotland's economic performance, and we have with us today a panel of witnesses. Welcome to all of you this morning. Um, from my right to left, first of all, Leah Hutchin, founder and CEO of Appointed, Karen Pickering, chair of the board of Page Park Architects, Paddy Collins, chief executive officer of the Aubin Group, and Alison Grieve, CEO and inventor of G-Hold. And Sarah Roberts is going to be joining us, I understand, later, but is delayed due to weather conditions. So if I might start with a um, question to our uh, panel of witnesses. First of all, looking to the past 10 years and how the Scottish economy has performed, uh, particularly with regard to entrepreneurship and business growth, and innovation. I'm just looking for comments from each of you on how you see matters uh, developing as we move forward. Um, I'm not sure who would like to start with a few comments on that. Volunteers, if you wish to put up your hand, uh, if you wish to come into the discussion, if you're not getting in, uh, otherwise simply just join in the discussion as we move on to the other questions from my fellow committee members. Paddy Collins. Well, I'll, I'll kick off. I'll, I'll kick off. Um, I, I speak from a little bit of a bubble coming from the northeast of Scotland, so I not really, I can't really speak about the rest of Scotland. I think the northeast we've been quite effective at being entrepreneurial, and uh, we've seen a lot of businesses grow and flourish. Um, I think to some extent we've, we've overheated, in Aberdeenshire and Aberdeen we overheated a bit and there was an element of correction. Um, but it certainly, I don't think there's any lack of, necessarily lack of entrepreneurship or desire to do, to be entrepreneurial. I think there, there may be more difficult challenges in money and resources and uh, infrastructure. Thank you. And I should say the sound desk will operate the mic, so there's no need to press any buttons, just, just speak. Um, Leah Hutchin. Um, I think I'd absolutely back up um, what you're saying there, Paddy. I think from an entrepreneur entrepreneurial um, standpoint, the past 10 years, you know, looking at the recession and, and certainly over, I think, the last five years, there's been a real growth in um, the startup culture, a real support for startups and scale-ups. Um, we at Appointed have benefited from the Scottish Edge Award, which I think has done a lot to impact those very early stage um, startup companies and to encourage that kind of um, growth in, in early stage companies, which then will start to, to power the economy in a more impactful way. I think over the last few years, having more I guess of a collaboration around the enterprise agencies has has really impacted as well. So, I think we're we're setting off into the next ten years a lot better than than things were looking back in two thousand and eight. Thank you. And I, I see we've been joined by Sarah Roberts, founder and CEO of Healthy Nibbles. Welcome to you as well. And. We've just started off with a question about the performance of the Scottish economy over the past 10 years and how our panel members see, see matters moving forward, um, in particularly with regards to entrepreneurship and business growth and innovation. So um, anyone else wish to comment before we move on to the next question? Alison Grieve? Yeah, I mean, I've seen a lot more support for the startup stage of businesses, but I still think that perhaps the scale-up phase is suffering somewhat for the Scottish business community. I also think, and I'm kind of caught with this opinion, because on the one hand, I can understand the need for a small country like Scotland to, to back certain winning horses, so certain categories of businesses that... Um, benefit a lot from investors coming to Scotland for that category specifically. So software as a service or Scotland food and drink or textiles, etc. And there's a lot of sense in getting behind those categories, but sometimes that's at a loss to certain companies that sit outside those kind of, you know, um, 
particular categories. So I don't know whether the right thing is to continue with that specified support or whether it is perhaps to broaden support out to certain companies that sit on the peripheral of those categories. Thank you. Um, we'll perhaps move on to a question now from John Mason, Deputy Convener, and the panel members shouldn't feel you need to respond to every question, but come in as and when you, you wish to or are brought in perhaps by committee members. John. Right, could I just ask a supplementary then to the previous, given what was just said, what are the companies in the peripheral that are not getting the support they need, uh, do you feel? So well, there was a huge exit recently, actually, of a company that um, was a hardware company. It's not public knowledge who they exited to, but I will say it was a US major, and it was you know quite a few hundred million pounds that they exited. But that they, they were not really supported within the Scottish ecosystem because they were a hardware business. So I wonder, however, uh, you know, how many other Scottish gems are not supported because they don't fit into those categories. I mean, we, we are an accessories business. We're a manufacturer, a hardware business. We, we don't fit into the categories that are part of particular ecosystems in Scotland. And sometimes we struggle with that, um, definitely. Okay. That's why I don't want to speak from a personal point <coughs> no, of view because, right. of course, there they will always be losers. And I'm not necessarily against the fact that, you, you know, there are great categories that investors can go, Scotland equals this fantastic community of businesses. But uh, there, there are losers in that system. I mean, I think, uh, well, colleagues will be asking more about how we grow businesses, I think, uh, in further questions, so I'll not go on to that. But I think, I mean, just for information, I mean, you can both give your own experiences and your view of the wider economy. I think we're happy to get both of these on the committee. My question then is really more about how do you see the next 10 years? You know, is it just going to be a repeat of the last 10 years? Or are there new challenges? Are there new opportunities? Are there new risks? You know, either for your business or more widely? That. Mr. Collins? Uh, well, yes, there, there certainly is uh, uh, new challenges. Uh, uh, one of the principal ones is what my wife insists that I call the B word because we don't allow it in the house anymore. <laughs> um, apart from that is the movement in technology is very rapid. The, there's a lot, if you, if you think back, what are the major companies that you, we see now on the world stage, Google, Facebook, these things, they didn't exist 20 years ago. So the, it's likely that large companies, the big businesses of, in 10 years' time, won't be the same businesses that we see today. Um, in the industry I represent work for, the oil and gas industry, yeah, we're going to see a lot of changes. We're, we're, not go, we're going to start to see us dismantling the, our infrastructure in the North Sea and putting it, um, putting it to sleep, and that's going to be a cost. And for Scotland, there's also going to be another cost because there's a lot of high-skilled jobs that are not going to be repeat reproduced so they're going to have to be reproduced somewhere else and we're going to have to do something else uh, and I'm not sure what that is uh -huh. are there opportunities then in there that I mean that skilled workforce can do something else or well, go somewhere else or of course there's that there, there, you've got you've got the skills the knowledge and the abilities you know a lot about doing things underwater for instance so there's there's opportunities into renewables there's opportunities in a whole variety of of areas in the sea. Uh, on the, the point about picking winners and things like that, I, I think it would be possibly more useful if you focused on creating a, 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 a valuable business environment, um, one that encourages business and, and uh, small and businesses to come for. I can give an example of one of the things I would think about, and that would be the issue of cash. Cash is one of the biggest issues for small companies. Um, one of the challenges that I have, possibly probably you have as well, is getting our customers to pay on time, mm -hmm. particularly the large ones. Um, and I, let me give you an example. As a company, we turn over about $12 million. So that's about a million dollars a month. Our payment terms are 30 days. So we need, a, we need to, to, to live for 30 days before we get a million dollars. If people pay us on 60, 60 days, we're effectively giving an interest-free loan to ask customers of a million dollars. Mm -hmm. If I don't have that million dollars, then I can't invest, invest in, use it to spend money to invest in, in, my, in my company, in my uh, staff, hire new people, 
invest in new technology and things like that. And yep. is that situation getting worse or is it getting better or is it much the same? I think it's getting worse. I think uh, particularly with uh, large companies, they think, well, those are our terms. You, you say, they say they'll mm. pay for 30 days and you turn up in 30 days and they won't do it. They won't answer your phone calls or they don't do everything like that. We're fortunate we, do, uh, we sell a consumable item. So when they don't pay and they, they order some more, we take the order, they turn up with the truck for it. And we don't, and we tell them, give us the money first, and then we get, get the chemical. But it's not, but it's not the case for a lot of other people. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, going forward, anyone else want to give us some thoughts for the next ten years? Um, um, I, just, I mean, Page Park, we're an employee-owned business, and I think business models should change in the next ten years. I think. Scotland is very attractive to um, you know, more international companies, but we need to protect the Scottish companies. And at, at Page Park, since we've become employee-owned, um, I mean, we've become more productive. So I think we need to make sure or try and protect smaller um, Scottish businesses from being taken over and being bought up, try and keep these companies local. I mean, I think some of us visited, uh, well, I suppose I'm slightly biased because you're in my constituency, but um, we did visit you before, mm -hmm. some of us from the committee, and there was the suggestion that, you know, some big construction projects, they like a kind of big name mm -hmm. architect yes. uh, rather than maybe a, a local one. Do, 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 is that something that you, you see as a challenge going what, forward? What we've or? found in the past 10 years, um, Scotland's become very attractive, I mean, I'm going to speak about construction, to global companies. So... Um, I suppose five years ago, we were very strong in, in the, the Scottish market, but over the past five years, we've been seeing a lot of competitors coming from London, even competitors now coming from, from you know, um, America and Australia. So it's more and more difficult for smaller Scottish companies to actually compete in that market. I mean, so I think in the next 10 years, it's going to be even um, more attractive. I mean, would leaving the EU affect that if we were able to, you know, be biased towards Scottish companies? Possibly, because at, at the moment we have to go through the European procurement process. So when we bid for projects, um, the, the, the building projects are advertised European-wide, so anybody can apply for those projects. And obviously you have to go through a selection process and then you have to tender. Um, but the, you know, it, the, the competition is just getting tougher and tougher. Okay. And, and as we know, with construction, it's it's a very um, it's a very long term industry. So we're the first to get hit when a recession appears. And we're the last to recover. So um, and as, as we know, with recent events with with, with Carillion, you know, it really is quite a, a competitive market. So you know, I think we just have to you know be very kind of wary of of that. <coughs> okay. I think Jamie Halko Johnson wanted to come in with a supplementary. Yeah, thank you, Kavina. Um, it, it was just actually on the point that Paddy Collins, you made about um, uh, cash flow and non-payment or delayed payment. From my experience, it tended to be the larger companies that did it, and they did it as a, uh, they do it as a kind of purposely to, to, to I suppose, as you say, kind of almost extend the loan. Um, what's your kind of experience? Does it tend to be the larger companies, medium, or is it completely across the kind of spectrum? It tends to be the larger companies, I generally agree with you. Um, they look at it as a means of low-cost financing for their business, mm -hmm. and it's reprehensible. And what would your suggestions be for, for dealing with that? What would I do? Oh, God. Um, <coughs> that I can say in a polite conversation. Um, it's... Uh, there really needs to... Th these people need to be named and shamed. There needs to be some sort of thing... I was thinking about this on the train coming down, because well, I thought I anticipated somebody who asked this question. I think you, the, the, one of the things you could do is, is require companies to publish how rapidly, that, what, what their payment terms are, how quick, whether they meet their payment terms, whether they, well, what, I mean, these are numbers that they have already. That isn't, it isn't expensive, because they're, they're already looking at their, their, their day's payment and how, they, how efficient they are. They want to get the money in quickly, but they don't want to pay the money out. Um, that's not that's not reasonable. Yeah. And you would suggest that this is this could, could particularly with smaller yeah. business could have a, a I, real. I think that would have a significant impact in helping smaller businesses progress. Yeah. When you're a small business, profit isn't the most important thing you think of in finance. It's cash. Mm. Cash is cash is king. Would you not agree, ladies? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm like a, I'm a, a thistle amongst roses here. Um, it's, it, I, I, it, if I, if you only, if I only come away with one point I've made today, it's, I need, we need to get paid on time. If we get paid on time, and to, we can finance ourselves self better. If we get paid on time, our banks are going to be, the bank is going to be more supportive to us. Mm -hmm. If we get paid on time, we can, we can go and employ people. None of us will get that money in and go, oh, lots of money, let's go and spend it on ourselves. We'll stick it back into our businesses because that's what we do. Yeah. I'm wondering, just bring to, to bring Sarah Roberts into the conversation, I mean, healthy nibbles presumably is a, you deal in consumables. Do you have a difficulty with payment uh, times? Um, we are actually quite fortunate at the moment, even though we deal with sort of the FTSE 100 companies, typically we do, we are finding that they are paying as they should be doing so far. So far, so good. Where we've experienced in terms of sort of bringing in the cash is king um, issue was more to do with supportive funding coming through the agencies. Um, so we'd recently, well, I say recently, in March last year, we, we'd applied for um, a small business loan through one of the one of the agencies, which is supposed to take 13 weeks for completion, and we are at week 33 now, I think, roughly. Um, so there are issues in terms of accessing to fund when you're sort of that going from a uh, startup to scale up, shall we say? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Gillian Martin want to come in with a supplementary. Yeah, uh, somebody used to run a small business. I am nodding along in agreement with uh, Paddy Collins about about people late pairs. Do you think legislation is the way to go? France, for example, has legislation that uh, compels companies to pay within a certain window? It could possibly help. I mean, you you try and persuade people as nicely as you can, but they don't listen. So probably is and people say, well, we don't really want legislation. But if, if you've tried everything else and none of that and nobody's mm -hmm. paid any attention, then you're left with legislation, aren't you? And, and I suppose another supplementary question, one of the issues that we've been talking about is companies with small businesses um, being reluctant to scale up and employ other people. Obviously, if you're not getting paid in time and that's a precarious existence, then you have the responsibility for your employees. you think if that was addressed that that would be uh, more comfortable in employing people quick, more quickly? You're all nodding. Yes. Yeah. Okay. We'd have more confidence in the future. I think, I'm, I, think I know the answer to that, actually. I would say most, most certainly around that, because I think there are, there are a lot of decisions you can make in terms of advancing different aspects of the business, but there is a certain that next step forward in terms of taking somebody on. Um, so obviously then the, the cash flow is, you can cope with fluctuations for certain things, but not when you're actually risking somebody else's livelihood. Yeah, and I think as well, the, the other aspect of that is that you also might pull back a little bit on sales so that your exposure is not so high. So, for example, if you were rolling a product out to, through a retail group, you would maybe just go for 10 retail sites rather than 50 because right. you can't risk the exposure being so high. So you're actually pulling back on, on, on revenue opportunities because you don't want that cash exposure in your business. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you. And now Jackie Bailey. You know, I can't help but remark it's 100 years to the day that some women got the vote, um, so I'm particularly pleased that Mr Collins is indeed outnumbered today. Um, but with that, with that, can I ask about automation and technological change, something that, that Mr Collins himself raised. It's come up as a theme in subsequent kind of um, evidence sessions that we've had, but we also know that the official statistics tell us that you know Scotland lags behind other countries in business research and development. So I'm interested in what do you think the opportunities are, what do you think the challenges are, and what do we need to do to capture some of this? And I'm happy for anybody to go first, but perhaps well, Karen. Construction, I think we'll actually see a huge change in construction with automation. Um, hopefully for the better, for the quality of the build that we that we will cr uh, create, but obviously to the detriment of, of jobs. You know, bricklaying can be done by robots. Um, demolition will be done by robots. So there's a whole range of skills that will probably go. So, I mean, I, there is a skill shortage in construction at the moment. So hopefully, 
It means that the more skilled um, workers can focus on, on the jobs that need to have people. But we will see a huge change, I think, in construction. Okay, thank you. I think you're absolutely right there, but I think the positive of that is freeing up those manual jobs to focus on innovation. I think construction is a really interesting area and Scotland has such a rich history of innovation. It would be great to see some of those skills being pointed towards exploring you know, training from the ground up um, and looking at new materials, for example, new way of generating power and such like. And I think automation allows that to happen. Um, as a company, we sell automation in, in a lot of ways. Appointed allows small and large businesses to automate the, the process of, of making appointments and then pushing those appointments and, and kind of reporting through the business. And the impact that we have on specifically on small businesses is amazing. We're quite often being told by our clients that they wouldn't be in business without appointed or that you know it frees them up to be doing extra services so therefore they can make more more profit um so i think it's undeniable the impact that automation can have i think the challenges are adoption of automation and i think specifically at you know the larger enterprise side it's quite easy small businesses are quite nimble and they they know what they need from um kind of their business tools and they can go out and and adopt quite easily i think it's more difficult at, at larger or at um kind of government level um but i do think that that will happen regardless of, of whether we we are you know proactive um in in adopting or not so i think i'd like to see more encouragement from um, the agencies to enable um, businesses of all size to to adopt technology and I'd love to see encouragement to adopt technology built in Scotland because I think there's some amazing um, technology companies based here it's a shame that um, Jamie from Codebase couldn't be here today because I think a lot of them are, are housed in Codebase a lot have been and are supported by Scottish Enterprise, <coughs> Scottish Investment Bank you know so building these world-class tools right here um, and it's a shame to see that there aren't more Scottish companies using Scottish technology at their heart because I think that that would make an impact on both sides of the coin. You, you seem to be suggesting, I think you're probably right, that there's very little kind of planning yeah. um, going on. We're, we're, we're looking ahead but not really doing much about it. Would that be a fair characterisation? Yeah, I think, and it, it's great, I think we're saying the right things and we're talking about the right things and I think there are some brilliant examples. So CivTech's a, a great example of, you know, looking at how we get startup or small business engagement with the the kind of yeah governmental side of, of procurement. Um, I think it's probably not as joined up when you move outside of that. So we're doing some really nice big headline things, but actually looking, and I don't know what the answer is, whether it's something that we can look at as, um, you know, whether there's financial <coughs> incentives or whether there is, who knows. Um, but I think if, if we can join that up, it will make a massive impact right along the chain. That's very helpful. Any other comments? We, we operate um, amongst competitors in India and China. <coughs> so we can't, you know, and the same with the Scottish economy, people in Scotland, we can't compete on price. We have to be smarter and faster than other people. Otherwise, we're just not going to, just not going to win the business and win the international trade that we need. Um, we've been, as a company, we've worked, we've been very keen, I've been very keen on innovation and we, we do spend a lot of effort on innovation in our business. We've looked at diversifying out of our core business, core activity, and we're developing new products for waste management um, for subsea applications and decommissioning and a lot of the, and some of that has been our own stuff but also we've had help from um, organizations such as OGIC and OGTC that have helped us bring that forward and it's not just money it's it's the linkages and the, um, the ability to, to meet people like OGIC could could get us to meet people in universities, OGTC could make good introductions into world companies to people we didn't know to our company. So those those things help. Um, but really and truly, there's, I mean, when I was listening to the lady here, we, we're talk, talking about jobs are going to be lost because we're going to they're going to be robots building robot 
house builders or bricklayers. I'm sort of thinking there, well, why isn't anybody making a, a robot bricklayer in Scotland? It's, it's not, I mean, it should be possible. It's the, the, the skills are certainly here. Um, yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I, I would agree. Um, I also think, you know, I speak it from the perspective of a, a, as a manufacturer, and definitely I see a lot of companies in our industry that manufacture over in China, primarily for pr pr plastic products. And I don't think that's necessary. I think that by getting behind certain technological advances, then, and with an emphasis on things like robotics in Scottish manufacturing, we wouldn't have to, but we don't, we manufacture in Scotland, but other companies could also manufacture in Scotland, I think, if the cost per unit was reduced by clever usage of things like robotics. So I think it, it's a very positive thing, um, but it perhaps needs a bit more support around the manufacturing companies um, that we use. And conceivably, based on what you're saying, it, it, the cost that would be stripped out would be a labour cost. Yeah. And, and for us, I think, you know, planning that, mitigating that, ensuring that people have alternative work um, would yes. be something that you would well, need to plan well, in advance. Those jobs no longer really exist in Scotland. That's the thing. I mean, we, we're, we're fairly labour intensive in what we do. Um, and we do all of the manufacturing and assembly in Scotland. But I think that for other companies, larger companies, a lot of the, you, those jobs are are not in Scotland anyway. They use manufacturing in, in China or um, in other places in the forest. So I think that it's important to acknowledge that, that there, there is no loss other than bringing that revenue to Scotland with some clever innovations and optimization processes. Okay, that's a helpful explanation. I don't know if Sarah would like to add anything. A great deal on tech, apart from just to um, reiterate what Paddy said, I think there's a, the, what we could benefit from from small businesses is um, a sort of connector block to the various tech companies, because certainly as we're looking at evolving, um, so part of, part of what Healthy Nibbles do is healthy vending, but we try and push that in terms of, so we're looking at um, integrating those machines with wearables and devices and how that can sort of push that sort of sector forward um, and did immediately look to London as opposed to necessarily looking to Scotland. Um, so I think there could be sort of an entity that sort of brings a, brings the sort of tech companies to um, mm -hmm. the smaller companies. It's very helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now to questions from Jamie Halker or Johnson. Um, some of the things we uh, I'm going to ask have actually kind of been covered, but um, uh, uh, we talked about I think you talked about the edge funding and the like. But I just wanted to have uh, ask ask the panel, you know, not only how we compare to countries, other countries, or Scotland compares to other countries in terms of creating um, small businesses, but also businesses that will you know will grow uh, quickly and become kind of major success stories. I think that international that UK comparison would be very interesting. My perspective, Appointed, has been massively supported and, and we've had a very um, positive experience of, of that kind of both financial and um, more skills-based and, and training. Um, we were one of the very first Scottish Edge um, winners and that was really how Appointed became a company. Up until that point it was me and I was outsourcing our development so we were awarded £30,000 and that enabled us to hire our first developer who is still with us and, and we've still since built um, a team of this 14 of us now. So that has been touched at, at each stage by Scottish Enterprise. Um, we've had match funding through the Scottish Investment Bank, which I think for me has, it's just one of the most impactful ways that that government money can, can help um, business because it, it's coming in and it's allowing private investment. It's, it feels like it's probably fairly light touch from a, from a management perspective. You know, you've, you've identified those, those match funding um, investment partners and being able to, to take the angel money, which, you know, we are well provisioned in Scotland from a point of view of, of um, angel investors, but being able to take that relatively smaller amount of money to what you might see down in London, but match that with um, Scottish Investment Bank has, has been amazing. So 
those touch points have really allowed each time we've needed to scale up or to, to invest in either infrastructure or staffing. Um, we've been able to access things that I do think allow us to compete with, you know, there are undoubtedly some restrictions that come from, from being building a company outside of London or in a smaller um, smaller region, but I think the benefits in, in our case certainly have outweighed the the downsides and we've been able to to punch above our weight at each time because we've been supported in, in that way. And then I think outside of that there's the other organisations like Entrepreneurial Scotland or Women's Enterprise Scotland, you know, those people who are then able to support around the outside as well. So I do think Scotland is for me one of one of probably the best places in the world to build a small business and to take that from idea to a point where you're you're making a positive impact on the economy. Yeah. Can I just come back very quickly? You mentioned light touch. Is that important to you in terms of the, in terms of things like the funding and support that you're not being asked to jump through too yeah. many hoops as well? Absolutely. So from a point of view, I think one of the things we maybe don't do as well is in the early stages where, and it, it's kind of to what Alison was saying earlier, I absolutely understand that there needs to be rigour around accessing money and it needs to there needs to be a process and there needs to be areas which are, are supported over others and a strategic decision there. The difficulty is when you are kind of asked to jump through hoops and then perhaps either the end goal isn't there or it isn't as impactful as it would have been. There have been occasions in the earlier stages of appointed where perhaps had we have focused on selling stuff rather yeah. than trying to raise um, raise money or, or support that that could have been more impactful. So I think it's just really important, I think, to be aware of the impact of whatever activity you're doing in a small business. You know, at the very beginning, you're one person mm -hmm. and where what there's an opportunity cost, I guess, to whatever you do. So I think allowing fairly light touch um, impact and allowing the companies to have control over so for me that's why edge was so impactful because it wasn't about accessing five thousand pounds to do branding exercise for example or two thousand pounds to do this and you're kind of trying to to jigsaw together a, a company that fits in with where the where the support is instead it was about here's a pot of money you know your business best yes we want to collaborate and we want to know what you're going to do with that money and, and there'll be touch points to make sure that you're spending wisely but by and large get on and do it because you you have a business plan you've gone through the the process to be awarded this money so go and spend it in the way that your business needs it and I think that's really important we need to trust businesses at an early stage that they will do the right thing for their business because like you said we you know there's there's a need and a want to reinvest um, and, and to build ambitious companies here. And did you find that the the, the support that you were getting, um, and, and whether that's financial or advice, etc., was that was coming quickly enough? It was coming as you needed it. I think it's mixed, and I think one of the one of my biggest frustrations, I think, is it can often depend on who you're working with. So in a Scottish enterprise sense, it can often depend on your account manager or or your particular needs, what sector you're in. Um, so I think it's not consistent across the board. Um, yeah. You know, there are, there'll be things, and we're lucky in Scotland, I think the, the entrepreneurial community is actually very joined up and there is collaboration. And so people do hear about things, but more often than I would like, I hear, hear about opportunities from other startups or, you know, consultants or, you know, mm. that community rather than hearing it from SDI or Scottish Enterprise or so I think that could do with and I know there's there's work being done to to do that but I think that's really important work so that there is a level playing field and the people who <coughs> can benefit most from the support are getting to know about the support. Okay. Sorry, I better let <laughs> other ask uh, questions of other people in the panel. I don't know if anybody's got anything particularly on that because you all ha have experiences of different different sectors. So I think um, a couple of touching on your sort of geographic haven't done a great deal outside of the UK but mm. certainly I am split between here and London and have found that we have a much better stronger ecosystem for the entrepreneurial community than down there 
Um, and even whether it be down to the smaller grants, like um, as mentioned, as far as for branding or whatever, just that being able to access those small pots of funds along the way um, is really encouraging for businesses and really, you know, I get a lot of positive, positive comments when I am down, down south about that. Um, but I would also reiterate about the inconsistency um, in terms of the advice and support that you can get from agencies. Uh, initially, when I first started Healthy Nibbles, I was speaking to an advisor who was based in Edinburgh who had actually never worked outside of um, the support uh, gateway. Um, and really, sort of the stipulation was that I wouldn't be able to get access to any funding. As we were sort of setting business up, we actually moved it out to Midlothian and I was then able to um, get access to a lot more funding um, and support. What I have found has been a struggle in our journey, certainly, has been the lack of being able to place us. So we're not quite tech. We are tech to a certain degree, but we're not quite tech and we're a retail, but we're not quite retail either. So it's sort of being able to sort of pigeonhole us has meant that we are not pigeonhole us, as the case may be, has meant that we haven't been able to access certain funds. Um, and in addition to the loan, there has been various other sort of situations where we found that it's been incredibly delayed um, in terms of being able to get access to relevant advice and support. It's all fair and well doing a sort of, sh shall we say, a strategy session, but that might not be at the time what we actually need. We could do with other support and just being able to almost bespoke fit to the company in terms of what that company needs because we might have internal strengths that we can draw on that we don't means we don't necessarily need certain things, but we need need other areas of expertise. Do you think that comes, you know, you, not being able to access that funding or having issues accessing that funding <laughs> comes because of the sector that you fall into or don't fall into? Is there also a question, a, a, a kind of gap in terms of the size of the company, that there are some, some companies that, uh, the size of companies that perhaps, you know, they may be bigger than, you know, a startup from Business Gateway, but not quite up to the level where Scottish Enterprise will be coming in and having I an account manager? That, yeah, I think that could could have been one of the potential gaps. We're just sort of hitting into the, sort of, shall we say, the account managed level of SE. Mm -hmm. um, but there has been that gap where it's kind of, we're, we're clearly in a high demand um, sector because we deal with corporate wellbeing. So we've got a lot of draw on us and most of our customers are sort of FTSE 100, top, you know, top businesses that we're dealing with. And there's been a massive demand in that, but it's then sort of being able to sort of drag this smaller business alongside and people, you know, we've had to co um, sort of handle that through lower employee numbers when actually we really do probably have the role for another five or six people to join the team, just not the funding yet. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I think there is that sort of divide where you sort of separate yourself from Business Gateway into SE, um, which could do with bridging a little better. I was just going to kind of widen out a little bit to, to essentially how we get to, we take successful small businesses up to, you know, scale them up to larger, medium or large size successful businesses. <laughs> um, one thing that I have found curious recently is that um, people don't talk so much about sales um, when you go through an investment round or when you get Scottish Enterprise grants. Once upon a time, I think about eight years ago, I had an investor who called my customers. That's a fairly basic thing to do in due diligence to check that you're dealing with who you're dealing with and what, at what kind of level of business they would expect to do with you. And yet none of that happens now. So the, there, there's much less of a focus on people actually selling their products and services and more of a focus on how many staff they employ or how much investment they have managed to bring on board. And I think that's a failing in Scotland right now if we're not focused on the actual revenue that is taken in through sales of goods and services. Is that coming from the agencies though, or just That's the investment just community, it's the, it's the agencies, it's the uh, is pretty much any route yeah. to, to funding. It feels that it's a lot more about are we going to be the next kind of Facebook and get these massive yeah. investment rounds on board? It's become more of a vanity thing than actually are we doing business with real life companies outside of Scotland? <laughs> and that's a prop. I mean, it's it's a massive problem as far as I'm concerned. 
I think that there should be a focus on revenue brought from sales more than above and beyond anything else if we actually want to reduce our trade deficit. Okay. I've got some experience of doing business overseas. We've had a, we've done business in the United States and we've done business in the Middle East. We do we do a lot of business in the Middle East. And we have about five or six people work for us in based in Dubai. Uh, about 65% of our business is in the Middle East, and when I mean that, I mean Saudi Arabia, UAE, Iraq, Oman, Kuwait, the, 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 that, those parts of the world. And I think one of the things we forget here is that we do have quite a, there are quite a lot of pluses to being in Scotland. We have a sensible legal system, so you know when you have a deal, you know you, know you have a deal. We have a, reason, a reasonable infrastructure, and we have significantly less, and you'll be surprised to hear this, bureaucracy than many other parts of the world, not just the Middle East, but also the United States of America. So there is a lot of, there's a lot going for us in being able to do things, being, being efficient and everything like that. So that goes back to what I said earlier about creating the right infrastructure and not creating more, creating more problems. Because one of the, the challenges that we, we've seen, I've had a number of people come, come down from bigger, in, bigger companies to come and work for us. Um, and one of the th you know, from senior roles in large companies, one of the things they discover is actually all the things they had to do in the big company, they still have to do in the small company. Mm -hmm. They just don't have the same amount of money or resources to do it in. So you still have to comply with the Bribery Act. You still have to comply with COSH. You still have to comply with the HS, HSC laws. You still have to meet ISO 9001. You still have to meet all of, do all of those things, but you don't have anywhere near as much money. So you have to be... Uh, uh, now, I've just said, I've said, said two things. Well, one thing is much e the bureaucracy is much less, um, and now I've just reeled off a whole load of bureaucracy that makes it a lot bigger. But... Believe, believe me, compared with other parts of the world, it is a, this is an easier place to do business than elsewhere. And you often find that when you speak to foreign companies and they set up in Scotland, that how much easier they find it to, to get things done and get, get stuff happening. Um, I did have and sorry, just just on that, because I mean, part uh, part part of understanding the complexities. Do you use Scottish Development International, or or do, uh, have you been? Do, do you tap into any of? Yes, we're we're an account managed company with Scottish Enterprise, and we've been to and we've used um, we've done a, been on a, a number of trade missions with SDI, and they've been very useful because they've been, they've SDI can get you in to beat people that you're not going to get in to meet. On your own, so we've had assistance in going and see, look, looking at our business opportunities in Algeria, for instance. Now, I wouldn't really know how to start doing business, looking at business in in Algeria, but through SDI, I can get, I can go in there and we can meet Sonatrack and those those people. Um, we've had opportunity. We're looking at opportunities for Norway, which is rather closer to home. We've, we haven't done a lot of business in Norway, but SDI can help us do, do things like that, and they can introduce us. And they, what's more, that they can introduce you at a higher level than you, were, you might otherwise go. So there is, there is some significant benefit in that. And often it's just like ringing up Scottish Enterprise and saying, I need to do, I'm trying to do this. Is there any way, any way you know, do you know anybody who can help us in this area? And they'll often be able to, to say, well, there's this person or there's that person. Or could, why don't you talk to Fred? He might know someone. Those contacts. On, on that point, perhaps we could move on to a question from Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like, <coughs> I'd like to explore this a bit further, this line of questioning about uh, specifically what support you have found helpful in your business, be it from the enterprise agencies or angel investors, um, and covering anything like um, the incorporation of technology or export, export finance, or increasing productivity in your business. Uh, perhaps if I could ask each of you to highlight maybe one specific example or, or more, if, if appropriate, of where the enterprise agencies or external investors have helped. And on the flip side, perhaps some cases where intervention from the um, agencies might not have been helpful, because it's very helpful for the committee to understand, you guys on the front line, to understand directly from business what actually in, in, in practice works and what doesn't work. We got assistance from Cooperative Development Scotland to help us become an employee-owned business. And I think if we hadn't have had that um, help and input, we probably wouldn't have gone down that route because we didn't really understand um, 
the, the kind of different business models that were out there. So um, that was a, a great help to us. And actually, we've been employee-owned now for four years, and we've actually seen our productivity increase. So really, that small amount of assistance, we've got financial assistance and a, a business advice, has really kind of transformed our business. So we've increased um, our staff numbers, we've increased our profitability, and I mean, because we're a service industry, it's difficult to measure um, productivity, but I think our architecture has improved, um, our staff are more innovative, um, we've, we've got different groups now that previously, when it was a, a traditional partnership, we all just kind of, you know, worked away and kind of told what to do, but now we, we're actually our own bosses. We found that we've got a lot more innovation within the business, that we've got um, a graphics group that's set up, we've got an innovative architecture group that's set up. So you can actually, you know, through that small amount of advice, we had a huge transformation in our, in our business. Would the others want to comment? I would always say that um, any support for trade shows is really valuable from Scottish Development International. I can't think of a single trade show that we've been supported in that hasn't brought an incredible return on investment. So um, I, I think that any contribution towards actual, you know, again, selling activities <laughs> is the most um, important and helpful in growing a business. Um, I have... I have I, I know that Scottish Development International is supposed to, um, you know, be growing as an organisation or at least be retaining the same budget as it had previously, but I'm seeing a lot of um, budget cuts in the number of trade shows that are attended by Scottish Development International. So I don't know where that money is now going, but it's not going into trade shows. Perspective. I've already talked about the impact um, financially of, of the Scottish Investment Bank um, investment into us, but I think one of the things that came along with that was um, a board observer who, who got involved in the business and has been a fantastic um, impact on the way we've, we've grown. Um, in our case, it was a female board observer, which was a fantastic impact on um, my board to kind of turned us into a 50-50 board, although it was um, in an observer capacity, and that was a uh, yeah, fantastic um, impact. On the negative side, I think it kind of speaks to a bit of what Sarah was speaking about earlier, around the support that, that you get at an early stage that sometimes could potentially lead you down the wrong path. Um, we had some supported um, marketing consultant work where they come in for five days or, or however long and actually the advice now knowing what I do know about kind of growing a business and, and building a business I look back and I'm horrified that we were given that advice supported by um, government agencies because it was it was just negative and it was negative both in kind of from a creative standpoint and and I think at worst could have could have put us off, um, you know, could have made us think that we couldn't do business and that we had had no future. And I think that's so dangerous when you're at that very early stage, you're much more likely to, to fail than succeed. So I think having a really rigorous process of making sure that anybody who comes into into contact with those early stage businesses is aware of, of the restraint and, and you know, understands the the context of the <coughs> business and and is able to advise with with that in mind because i think it, it's really dangerous if if not I would, I would agree with that that i think um i did come into this opportunity with a fair a reasonable amount of experience mm. of commercial experience behind me and had having had supported a lot of um startups previously or advised on startups and i think um, on a positive, access to funding and support is, is obviously going to encourage people to give it a go. Mm. Um, but I do think that there needs to be that sort of awareness of what um, it takes to run a business, what you're going to have to face, the pitfalls, the opportunities, but also being able to manage that in a really cautious, sort of controlled way as well, rather than just 
spread and go. Yep. Um, having said that, in terms of, I think the sort of, I would say the big feedback is consistency from the agencies um, and timeliness, but timeliness in a commercial sense rather than a sort of agency sense. You know, f for us, a 12 week lead time for something, I could have changed direction of the business in 12 weeks mm. almost. Um, it sounds rather erratic, does that? But it's, it's just sort of keeping up with the sort of the speed at which um, startups and scale ups move um, would be key. We, we've had benefits in a, in a different way we've, where we've had periods where we've wanted to grow and we needed to get key individuals on board and we've had, we've had the benefit of, of Scottish Enterprises uh, manager for hire. Mm -hmm. So we've got, got some assistance yeah. in that to get us over that first big gulp. Gosh, he's a bit expensive. Can we really afford it? Oh, yes, we can. Let's do that. We get the person, the individual on board. They they help transform the business, and you move on to the next stage because businesses are built by people. Mm -hmm. um, I'll be a bit cheeky and say we're 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 not finding when we don't think we're getting a great deal of help. We just drop it and move on and say thanks very much and don't get, don't get back. Um, <clears throat> so we don't. So we we haven't seen that that problem. And I perhaps it's the uh, degree of. The benefit I had was I came into this, my business, having run a business as many top for, for a number of years before, so I had a lot of experience. So when people would, experts would tell me that that wasn't going to work, I didn't necessarily always believe them, um, and probably just as well. Thank you. There's a couple of supplementaries from Gordon MacDonald and then Tom Arthur. Thanks very much, Kavina. Just getting back to the point about um, trade shows, international trade shows. Uh, there was a comment made about the number of SDI um, trade shows possibly dropping, but what other agencies are involved in carrying out trade shows? It's not just SDI that carry out trade shows. Um, in two th uh, last session, we actually carried out a inquiry into the amount of duplication there was between the different agencies. And I was just wondering if you thought that that amount of duplication had reduced and if, and if it had, was that part of the reason why Scotland was now the third fastest growth rate for exporting businesses in Great Britain, according to the Scottish Parliament Information Service? Who would like right. to? Uh, so, uh, uh, well, I mean, th that's, that's fantastic if that, if that was the, the issue previously. Perhaps it, it's maybe perhaps in the area of food and drink, where there'd be Scotland Food and Drink and Scottish Development Internet. I mean, I, I don't know the specific examples of duplication, but... Chamber of Commerce, I, UKTI, etc. Attending international trade shows. Yeah, I mean, but that, that could perhaps be the case, but um, certainly I just came back from CES, which is plastered over the world's media every year and is the largest consumer electronics trade mm. show in the world. And there was no official Scottish presence at all, not a meeting room, nothing. And no Scottish company was told that UKTI would have any presence at all last year. They didn't have so much of, uh, as a meeting room last year. And I, so I, I, I did know Scottish companies to go out there, but they went there on their own accord. There was no kind of official presence, which... It was quite a shame given that it's a, a trade show that has the, every single industry in the world represented there and the future of technology. I thought that that was perhaps falling short. Um, Were you able to make inquiries to find out why that was the situation? Um, well, yeah, I actually spoke yesterday to Scottish Development International, and I, you know, I, I'd certainly all the individuals I know within that, that organisation are fantastic. They just deal with what they're what what they what they have um but they said that what the mobile world congress in barcelona which is a by comparison smaller show um but it's more expensive so they said that it was because mobile world congress is more expensive that's why scotland has a stand whereas ces is cheaper so scottish companies should be to go there so I don't know I mean it was a confusing message to get um, and I thought that it was a shame as well for the that the Scottish uh, Development International account managers were not able to attend CES themselves even just to walk the show because again there's just so m many opportunities at that show 
So, yeah, I, I know it's a difficult decision, but I, I no, at no trade show that I have ever been at have I seen duplication between Scotland stands. I, ha I haven't seen that, but clearly if that's been an issue in the past, then that's, that's an issue. Again, on um, trade shows, I'm just curious as to what the relative importance of trade shows within the European Union are, particularly for businesses that are just taking their first steps in internationalisation. So, in terms of people attending trade shows that fall within the European Union, I, I mean, again, I, I'm kind of biased. Ninety percent of our of our export goes to the United States, so we're used to the complexities no. of. Inco terms and taxation and and um, uh, so for us it, d it makes no difference to us whether we're exporting mm -hmm. to Europe or whether we're exporting to the states, mm -hmm. whether we're in a in a in a trade union or not. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, there are, for example, Mobile World Congress, that's in Barcelona. I don't know how that would impact people going over to a trade show in a European location, because generally these shows are international trade shows, so you'll have representation from all over the world at them. Not necessarily it's in Europe and therefore there's only European companies yeah. in attendance. It's, it's purely, actually, more specifically to do with the customs union and the imposition of carnies, which would, you know, as a consequence, I'm certainly going to lead a debate on Parliament and the impact this will have on musicians touring, but it will be, oh, yes. it will be far more pronounced. But I appreciate for um, larger and more established companies who have the capacity in terms of um, dealing with that added bureaucracy. And it was just specifically if there are certain companies who benefit in particular from taking their first steps in internationalisation at European trade shows and making sure that if we do find ourselves outside of the custom union, there's that additional support in place to support yeah. companies. I, I do, I, th I think that there ha there was a programme, I don't know whether it still exists, that was called Smart Exporter when I started um, the company and that was very useful about going through what INCO terms were, how to export goods and services um, and I actually don't think it's that much more complicated if we ha suddenly have to deal with that as a percentage on, you know, whatever goods you've got going out there. Mm. It's annoying to have to queue in a visa line. It's, you know, there's a little bit of added complication, but m I might be on my own here, but I, maybe as well, because we do so much over in the States, I just mm. don't think it's going to have as much of an impact as people are freaking out about. I think that it's just another stage of learning. That's fine. Certainly, for, for musicians, it can actually have a severe impact on the, the profit, profitability of the tour. But I'm quite keen, just as we go through this Brexit process, to explore how it impacts in different sectors. Well, in so terms of the in, in terms of the visa requirements, the they, visa they need to visa specifically carnies as well, um, because right. clearly, obviously, if you're taking a certain number of goods in, you have to demonstrate that you're taking them back out. Back out, yeah. Um, and again, that's just for particularly for potentially a business engaging in its first international mm -hmm. trade show um, where margins are very tight, will there need to be additional support? Because when it's, obviously as I say, for the more established organisation as a company, it's not a problem, but for someone taking that first step, it yeah. could be prohibitive. Yeah, I mean, it d definitely there will need to be agency support there, I, I would imagine. I mean, as I say, there, there was when mm. we started with this smart exporter, you could ch call up Chambers International and say, look, mm. I'm thinking about taking goods, but for display only, and then I want mm. to take them back out of the country. And um, certainly w there was n nothing it's always easier to say in hindsight oh it was mm. easy you know maybe maybe Which I find it a bit more complicated at the time but um yeah I certainly would not like to see musicians suffer financially by mm. the fact that you know it's become more complicated um but generally goods are just they just have a documentation as long as the documentation is in order then it should be fine for them to take instruments in and take it back well there's in. a significant charge on it is there? Yes, for companies. <laughs> well, it will be um, about with the customs union. But I won't take up any more of a OK, sorry. I, d I, didn't, I wa wasn't right. aware of yeah, that. That yeah. does sound... Per perhaps a topic for another time. Yes. I'll just come back to Dean Lockhart before we move on to questions from Colin Beattie. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thanks very much for your invaluable feedback in, in, the, in terms of specific help that you've had in the past. 
Uh, we've heard in other sessions that um, companies trying to access enterprise support have found it quite a cluttered landscape with uh, difficulty establishing where to start in terms of where do I start the process, lots of agencies involved. Is that something you've experienced uh, when you started your, your journey? Yes. Right. It's put simply, yes. There are, there's, a lot, there's lots of support and there's lots of things, but it, unless you have a guide like an account manager, you're never going to identify what support is available for you and which is the most appropriate support. Um, for, for somebody coming from outside, from a starting up in business, it's very difficult. There are a lot, there are lots and lots of different schemes, and some, and a lot of them overlap, and some of them are a little bit contradictory, or they appear to be, yeah. and so it can be very difficult to work out which is the right one. We, we're, we're very fortunate. We've got a very good uh, account manager, who looks basically looks after us and shows us points as well. Is this this thing you can go after, or how, are you aware of that? Or perhaps you should be going to look, look at that. That would help you in your business. If you don't have that resource, you're not. Go it's going to be very difficult to get money from the Scottish Enterprise. Okay, there seems to be seems to be agreement amongst the, the witnesses. That's the case. Yes. And I think that's what I was talking to earlier, where that isn't consistent across all companies. So yeah. that's amazing that you have that. I think it's not in place for all companies. So you'll find some companies who are fantastic at getting that mm. support, and of course will flourish because of that. But others that that don't know about things that they probably should. Thank you. Thank you. And Colin Beattie. Thank you, Vera. I'd like to move on to something a wee bit different. Um, this committee has taken evidence that Scotland, um, in recent times at least, has had poor productivity growth. The Scottish Fiscal Commission believes that since the so-called Great Re Recession, um, this has become structural rather than cyclical. They believe, the, Scottish, the Scottish Fiscal Commission believes that Scotland, like other advanced economies, is moving into a long-term poor productivity growth period. Do you agree with that? I disagree with that. I think there's a lot happening around the startup side of things. There's a lot happening in scale-ups. I think there are challenges, and of course there are, you know, we've, as you say, come out of a recession or are coming out, depending on <laughs> what you read. Um, so I think, yeah, it's not without its challenges. Um, but I think Scotland is well placed to, to fight those challenges. I think there's a lot of appetite for fighting those challenges. I think, you know, some of the stats around the amount of companies that are starting up um, and those companies that are starting to export, and you know, we're seeing that growth. It's not going to happen overnight, and I think there needs to be a support and an understanding that large companies that that can help us grow. You know, we've seen some fantastic ones here with Skyscanner and um, Fanjul, and you know, those kind of companies that have the ability to scale. It takes time, and I think there needs to be the the support and understanding that that's a a longer term journey, but. No, I would absolutely disagree that... Can, that can I just clarify then what you're saying? You're saying that you don't believe that low productivity growth is structural, that it is still part of the cycle of coming out of the recession. So I think, I think what I'm saying is that the appetite for growth and the ability to grow is better here than it is in certainly in other countries, probably better than it is in England um, at the moment. I think there's a real opportunity and appetite for growth here, and I think that, that will continue. I, I, I agree. I don't think there's a product. Let, let, let me put it this way. The northeast of Scotland has some of the highest productivity, not only in Scotland, but in the rest of the UK. And there's a reason for that. People are expensive, and they're difficult to come by. If you're a hiring expensive, if if, peop, if your people are expensive, you want to get the most possible value out of them that you can. So you'll train them as well as you can, and you'll give them a and you'll give them all the tools to make them as productive as you can. Because you can't get very many more, and and they're quite. And if you do get more people, they're expensive. So that's so I think there's there's a link between high pay, low pay, and poor productivity. And I think there's there's some evidence to suggest that. 
if we can be, I mean, it's it's well known. If we if we can be successful in product have uh, high levels of productivity in the northeast of Scotland, you can have high levels of productivity in the rest of Scotland. And the question is, why aren't you getting the same levels of productivity in the rest of Scotland that you see in the northeast? That's a question I was going to ask you. Well, <laughs> thank, you, well I, thank you very much for giving, for asking me that. Um, I think it's it, it, it comes back to the. One, you have to invest on pe in people, in training, in skills, and, and everything, uh, and in equipment. If you don't give a person the right tools, they can't do the job. So you get you give them the right tools. You buy the you buy the right computer to allow them to work on the thing. You give them you get, give them access to high speed broadband. You send them on training courses to learn how to use software programs to to do to do things. Or in my case, you hire chemists, you hire high quality chemists, and you give them and you build fancy labs for them to work on and to do their to do their stuff. If you don't do those things, you're not going to get high productivity. Is the high productivity is to my mind linked the low productivity is linked to low investment. If people aren't making low, if people don't invest in their businesses, they are not going to get the productivity they need. There's a lot of people go around going, oh we're not so good at this, we're not so good at that. Well yeah, but Geez, guys, foreign companies come here and they get much more product. They get higher pro levels of productivity from uh, Scottish employees than they, than local companies. And why is that? They spend more money on them, they train them better, and they give them more, the right equipment. If you don't do that, you won't get the productivity. If you do do that, you will get the productivity. So can I say that uh, we took evidence last week from Jim McCall, and he believed that the key to the to productivity was happiness, job security, and a fair wage. In broad terms, is that is that correct? Is that what you're saying? Well, if you invest in people and you put, and you invest in their skills and you give them a, pro, a, a decent place to work in and you give them uh, the right tools to do the job, you're going to get ha happiness, all, all of those things that Jim said. So I would generally agree with him, but from, from, slight, from coming from a slightly different perspective. You have to generate a, an environment where people enjoy coming to work uh, and, are, and are productive but if you don't spend the money if you don't invest in people you won't get the productivity it just it's you know it's unre you it's unreasonable to expect people to just work harder um if you why would they work if you give it's much better to give them the right tools to allow them to get through business their work much more efficiently and be more productive rather than just working harder and is there evidence, uh, in your mind at least, that uh, in the Scottish economy, Scottish companies are not making that investment? Well, again, I come, I, I live in a bit of a bubble. I work in a company in, the, in, in rural Aberdeenshire that does make that investment. I go and see other companies. I'm going, mm, don't think they're much cop, uh, because of because they don't they don't make that investment in those sort of things. You 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 read about things. You you visit. You visit other companies and you become aware of that. You go and see your companies in other parts of the world and you can see where people are making those investments and they do get those results. It's not for me to say, are other bits of Scotland not doing that? My contention is if you don't spend the money, you won't get the productivity. If other parts of Scotland aren't getting the productivity, then I would suggest possibly they're not spending the money. I maybe add in as well. I mean, because we're an employee-owned business, I probably um, own a little bubble as well. But the other employee-owned businesses that we deal with, they do have, you know, great staff morale, great staff happiness, and that hence brings better productivity. I mean, what, what we have in our businesses, every employee has a voice. So you know, we regularly meet, we communicate. So everybody feels as though they're in control of their own destiny. And I think if employees feel like that. They put more in, in into the business. I, I don't think that's necessary a requirement to be an employee-owned company. It's quite. Mm -hmm. I mean, that you are an employee-owned company really helps, but that, but it, it, you know, it comes back to another bugbear: is a lot of companies in Scotland are not very well managed. I mean, you know that yourselves. We've, we've all been to businesses where we've seen they're not very well managed, and you look at the guy and you say, well, if you're clearing off at three o'clock in the afternoon to play golf, and you're leaving all your staff working away why do you think they're going to be breaking their necks for you matey um if you turn up at 10 o'clock and everybody else has got to turn up at eight 
they ain't going to make an effort. If you're turning up at eight and you're and you're if you're the first person to get there and you're the last person to leave, everyone else is going to think that yeah you're making a bit of an effort and they should make a bit of an effort too. But given that we have uh, a lower productivity growth rate here in Scotland, but even compared to the rest of the UK and many European countries, does that mean that this is a problem that is endemic in Scotland? That it's uh, something that uh, you know needs addressed urgently? Well, I think if you were, I think you kind of answered your own question there, <laughs> didn't you? Is of course is if you want Scotland to be strong and successful and wealthy and uh, and we want to have all the resources for the teachers and the nurses and the social care that we want, we need to have a, a good ta we need to get more taxes. We'll only get more taxes if we have a strong business sector. So yes, I think there is a, that is a structural issue, and yes, that is something that you need to to think about. Is it an education issue? Should more business training happen in schools? I mean, at what point do you start to change the culture, especially if some people think that it's become a structural rather than cyclical thing, then surely, surely the earlier we get into training, the better. To what degree do, do businesses actually engage with schools at this point? Yeah, I know that that is... There are is, various programmes. Yeah, there are, there are. So I think that that's definitely a positive thing. Um, and there, there are interesting pockets of activity happening and there's things like digital schools. So it will be interesting to see how that starts to play out in five years' time, ten years' time, when those students are actually out in the business community. How do you feed this back to the powers that be? I mean, you clearly think that there needs to be more engagement from schools to develop those business skills. How do you feed that back? Well, I mean, the last time I gave evidence, I had an idea of a scheme that was more about international trade, actually, and to create an international mindset in Scottish schools. Um, so I think that I think I think that is being fed back um, again in pockets of activity. I don't know whether there should be more of a formalised process, but surely that's you know that's part of why we're here today. Um, so. I mean, I'm not sure. Is it, uh, who do you feed that back to? Do you feed it back to Scottish Enterprise that there should be more engagement with schools, you know, or um, uh, d w what would you suggest? <laughs> I'm not answering right. questions, <laughs> <laughs> but there are different agencies for that. Let me yeah. move on to something just slightly different. What do you think are the the top most challenging issues for new or expanding Scottish? companies, firms, and what do you think policymakers, both in Scotland and at UK level, could do on a practical basis to help them? Add on that. Um, I just want to sort of go nip back to the other conversation as well and then link, link into this. A couple of things on productivity. So one of the things that Healthy Nibbles do is obviously work within corporate wellness, and that's the predominant um, sort of driver of our, our customers what we're finding is sort of building on what paddy said as far as keeping um, your employees and your team happy is that where there has been sound nutrition there's actually been a 66 percent increase in productivity and 15 percent less um, days off taken per annum from people that have got healthier diets um, which is one thing and then um, just in terms of what Alison said as far as the younger audience um, what in our personal experience, what we um, have been through over the last year is, you know, it's the end of 2016, we were going to take on a modern apprentice, um, and it was something that I was, um, well, I'm really passionate about sort of feeding back into the youth. Um, there was a change of circumstance in the business, so we couldn't do, but at that stage, it was, I think, from recollection, of around 75% funded um, by, I think it was Edinburgh Council, but it was through the Business Gateway Network. Um, when I came to take on um, our current modern apprentice, um, the support infrastructure around that had changed in as much as to get support, the person had to be um, what I would have said is highly emotional dependent, uh, dependent on their infrastructure. So they had to have had a drug issue or be, you know, released from prison, had been a child carer, um, which for a younger business going through from startup to scale up is, was very, very challenging. Um, 
in terms of taking, committing to taking somebody. I mean, in the end, we just took somebody and paid the full price for them. So that's, that's actually worked out. Um, I think in terms of sort of moving forward, in terms of improving the situation, I think um, access to support for, um, I think we've all reiterated it many times, but the consistency of support that you can get, whether you are a women-led business, whether you're a high achiever, whether you are in a different subsector that doesn't quite fit the bill in a certain category. Um, or even accessing underachievers, um, so those that are maybe not doing it, faring so well at school, that there is an opportunity for them to get involved in, in business of some description, um, whether it's part support. I certainly know the modern apprentice we've got at the moment. We took him on at 16 years old, and he had left school with significant issues in the schooling, but he's been a, an absolute tremendous um, sort of blessing and support on the company. So... Um, I think, yeah, some more sort of youth engagement would be really beneficial. Anyone else got a view on the, what policymakers can do to tackle the top barriers for Scottish companies? Perhaps. I mean, I thought the, 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 the cash flow point yeah. um, right at the beginning was actually really interesting. So ca access to finance and cash management, cash support is, is always useful. Um, whether that's some form of national ledger of non-payers or wh wh however you might roll out that process. But um, also recognition of the fact that for a lot of Scottish companies that started in a very challenging re recession, uh, there is still nervousness around bank funding. Um, a lot of companies are very cautious about what they take in terms of bank funding, which at the scale up, stage is actually quite challenging because traditionally that's the space that banks used to dominate and where you have that nervousness around taking that finance there needs to be some kind of um, replacement for that funding but I and thought there were alternative there are I mean the, the, so there are there are um, there's equity finance so you know investment and that's very well supported um, but where a lot of investors draw back a little bit is where you have um, the EIS scheme, which is the Enterprise Investment Scheme, so it's fantastic tax relief for investors. But for things like loan, loan notes or loan finance, they're not eligible for that great tax break. And actually, there used to be, um, HMRC used to have a scheme whereby you could potentially still tap, tap into that tax break as an investor giving a loan to a company at the point of scale up. Um, now, now you can't, it's very complicated. So where investors would maybe have stepped in where a loan was most sensible, almost like bridging finance, now they're not doing that because they don't get that extra tax incentive. So, um, so th th that's just one example of where perhaps there might be some kind of provision around loans rather than you know companies, founders continually selling off. Um, equity in their businesses. Would you consider that the environment for new and growing Scottish companies at the moment is, from a policymaker's point of view, where it should be, in spite of these different tweaks and so on that you're talking do, about? Do you, do you think that this, the 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 the, the startup community is where it should be, or or I'm the, just talking or about just the general... general environment and support that's available for new businesses yeah i think that scotland will always face that point of scale up. scale up is where it's most challenging um but that's not anything new i think that that's that's indicative of being quite a small country and so it's easy to grow startup businesses in that kind of environment and um, but it's very difficult to support a raft of scale up businesses because we're just a small country, so I'm not entirely sure what the answers are, but perhaps just some more funding mechanisms around that point of funding customers and funding stock, you know, traditionally bank finance kind of zones, um, that that could be helpful if there were certain policies looked at around that and where, you know, the other countries have got examples of that. Right. I'm mindful of time and a number of other committee members who'd like to come in. I'm, I'm thinking perhaps just on that last point, Jackie Bailey had a question that might tie in with that. 
for the second <laughs> panel, not this one. Oh, well, that's that's fine then. Um, John Mason, did you have a question? Okay, uh, yes, well, quickly. Um, I mean, I do notice that we have uh, four panel members are female today, which is uh, fabulous, out of uh, five. But are there particular issues facing women uh, in setting up businesses and growing businesses? I think there are unique challenges um, to being a female-led business. I think there are unique opportunities as well, um, and I think the numbers speak for themselves um, from a results um, point of view. I think it can be difficult um, in the early stages. I think there are challenges around, um, so I have just had a baby, and my husband and I did shared parental leave, which worked fantastically for us and actually was really easy to access and understand and navigate. Um, and I think it's fantastic what the Scottish Government is doing around um, increasing access to childcare and such like. One of the things I think that could make an impact is allowing access to that sooner rather than having to wait the, the three years to, to access that just to shorten or to allow parents to, to go back to work more quickly. You mean before the child is three years old? Yes. Yes, right. Yes, right. so right. just being able to access that. And I, d I don't know whether it has to be about there being more of it, just having more of a flexibility. One of the things that really impressed me with the shared parental leave was the flexibility of just, again, having that light touch and being able to manage it to how it works for both your business and your family. Because I do think... You know, it's the tradi traditional mindset, but it is often the case that, that the child care falls to the the female caregiver. Um, so I think there's that, that side of things. I think the other side is just looking, we've all talked about the consistency, um, and I think looking at how we report on, on the female, on the gender um, spread of support. So where, you know, where agencies are spending their money and looking at, I think, you know, 50-50 by 2020 is amazing. If we started looking and taking that mindset while, when looking at support <coughs> agencies and, and where mm. the money and the support... I mean, we had the suggestion before at committee that some of the agencies like Scottish Enterprise were, were just... They just wanted jobs no matter what, and they weren't really looking very much at whether it was women-led or how many women were involved and that kind of thing. I think that's that's possibly true. Um, I mean, we've been really lucky. We've we've had great support, and in some ways, it's fantastic that it doesn't matter whether we're a female-led company or not. But I think, in order to get to where we all want to be and where we want to see the numbers and you know the impact that that will have, I think it would be good if if there was a look at that. And you can't work on what you're not measuring and I think at the moment and I know it's difficult I know there was some um, talk around you know at the moment actively Scottish Enterprise isn't allowed to support things that they think will will specifically um, help female-led businesses and I think removing some of the constraints I don't know whether that's you know tying in with um, the EU and, and that side of things maybe that will be something that that will change but I think there is, there's a lack of female-led businesses. It is amazing that there are so many here today. <laughs> okay, thanks so much. Yeah. And I think it depends on the industry you're in as well, because obviously in construction, I mean, just even employees in the construction industry, it's, it's very male-dominated. To, so to actually have a, a female-led business would be difficult. So I think it is down to education as well, that we really have to educate, you know, girls in, in schools that... You know there is opportunity out there in construction or any other of the, the technology businesses. Thank you. I think as well, certainly through um, I'm uh, one of the ambassadors at Women's Enterprise Scotland, and certainly through one of the um, thought thoughts around that is um, was some stats, but just that Scottish Enterprise, the um, high growth businesses, only reflect 3.2 percent of the account managed ones that are women run, run. But also looking at the diversity of the roles that a woman typically does. Um, in terms of not just bring it, raising a family, but then the the other side of that where they've got aging parents potentially, and typically it can fall on the woman to sort of navigate that side of things as well. Um, so I think there are there are a number of sort of um, I was actually talking about it on radio this morning again a couple of incidences where. Um, it was only last quarter last year where two women were trying to raise funding and they were unable to. So they actually dressed up as men, went in, got the funding and sort of... I know that is definitely on the extreme, 
but it does show that there are some issues that we we may be on the centenary, but we need to be <laughs> making some light years ahead. I, I have ha heard it um, spoken of. In fact, in the Business in Parliament event, I heard that apparently research shows that women want to be treated differently by support organisations. That doesn't speak to me. I just want to be treated the same. Um, on certain things around education, as you say, um, certain industries that are male dominated going into schools and speaking to girls to get them into STEM subjects, I think it is important that, the, that men are asked to do that as well as women because if you just have female entrepreneurs going into schools to talk to girls, it's not giving a fair reflection of what the landscape is when they get into certain manufacturing or construction jobs. So it becomes this kind of false cosmetic promotional activity, which um, I don't think it, I think it's probably counterintuitive. Um, so certainly we all, I think, agree that women need to be paid the same and that there needs to be the same opportunities, but um, I don't think that we'll get that by preaching to the converted and having the pressure put on women to answer the question about what, how to create more gender equality. I'd quite like to see my male peers being asked that question. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. Uh, gosh, um, OK, uh, well, I'm probably tick a number of boxes there. I work in the oil and gas, our business is in the oil and gas industry, and we do do chemistry, so it's, we're a STEM subject. In fact, we've got about 50% of our staff are female, and that operates throughout the organisation. So the CFO, my number two, is a, is a lady, um, and our, a lot of our technical staff are female as well. The buyer is a female, the, the, the supply chain manager is a female, the people in charge of quality assurance are female, you know, it's fairly mixed. I've been told in the past that I am prejudiced when I hire people. I tend to hire too many women, um, and for the reason, and the reason it is, is that if somebody comes, if a young woman comes to want look for a job in the oil and gas industry, well, good for her, um, because we need more people, in, more women in the oil and gas industry. So I'll encourage her to come and come and work for us. I have had the experience recently of had a young woman quit on me to set up her own business um, as a personal trainer, but she has a much bigger bigger game plan on that. I was, I was not very pleased because she's a very good chemist and I didn't really want to lose her, but anyway, there she goes. At the end of the, at the, end of the meeting, I wished her well, and I do hope she does really well because I think she will. She's a very determined individual and, I think, and she's very capable. Uh, she's also 24, so there's... Um, she, uh, uh, she, she wants to get into nutrition and healthcare and helping people to be to be better and. Okay, uh, I, I, mean, and I think we could themselves. probably explore this a bit further, so, but I yes, think we're a bit pushed for time. Yeah. So back to the <laughs> convener. Yes, well, I, I think um, some some questions may have to wait to the second session, um, and I see we're we're rather um, pushed for time here. So I'd like to thank this panel very much for coming in today, and I'll suspend the session to let the next panel take their places. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Well, good morning again, and thank you to our second panel for coming in this morning. Um, from my right to left, we have Professor Gary McEwen, Chief Executive of Elevator, Vicky Brock, who's the founder of Clear Returns, Laurie Russell, Chief Executive of the WISE Group, and Johnny Kinross, Chief Executive of the Grass Market Community Project. So, good morning to all four of you. We'll start off with a question from um, Jackie Bailey. I know, to this panel rather than the, the, the previous one. Um, many of you will know that I'm a long time, long time fan of social enterprises. Um, so I'm keen to know, in, in your words, what you contribute to developing a stronger economy and what more you would expect government to do to help you in that process. And I'll start with Laurie Russell, because I've probably known you the longest, Laurie. <laughs> I suspect so. Yeah, that's just because I'm the oldest. Um, <laughs> I think we have a huge role to play in creating an inclusive Scottish economy because social enterprises tend to contribute to the economic success of Scotland and tackle social issues at the same time and often environmental issues. I think we are a business model that makes sense to Scots. We are creative, we're innovative, we're entrepreneurial, but at the same time, we care about the impact we have on communities and on vulnerable groups. Many of us, including the WISE Group, are set up as supported businesses, which in the EU definition means that we employ a proportion, in our case it's 32% of our employees, or 240 odd employees, are either living in the most deprived communities in Scotland, have got a background um, that might involve them being homeless or addicted or in prison or have a health issue or a disability. And I think that is a key element to Scotland's success in the future because that does demonstrate that we are inclusive. In terms of what we could do more, I'm going to use a word that one of the panellists used this morning, trust us more. We are more accountable. We demonstrate what social impact we make. We can often measure that. We save the public purse often money that would be spent on individuals because we can reduce their re-offending, for example, or keep them out of prison, or get them into employment when they've been out of employment for a long time. And we can demonstra demonstrate that in a way that actually lots of the public sector agencies um, that get public money don't do particularly well, and it's not normally a requirement on the private sector. So I, th I think we have a huge role in uh, in the next 10 years in, in demonstrating that Scotland could really achieve an inclusive economy. I would just echo everything that uh, Laurie said there. And um, I mean, basically feel that, uh, um, again, it's really good to hear the, the, the first panel and uh, their experiences. We do exactly the same as them, but more, in my opinion, in the, in the sense that we are um, uh, creating jobs. Uh, our contribution to employment is, is huge, I think, especially for the size of our sector. We are um, creating opportunities for um, people to generate, create skills that then can set up their own businesses, that can work in other people's businesses when they move on. And most importantly for me, we work with the people that so often, certainly this is the grass market community projects uh, situation, that the commercial sector doesn't want and the public sector doesn't really particularly want either because they're complicated. And uh, because of our particular business model, um, because we tap into huge social capital and, um, um, and the availability of volunteers and resources and, and uh, um, all those sorts of things, we can actually work with people who would otherwise just be excluded from the uh, um, uh, Scottish economy and uh, wouldn't be a, able to work and, and contribute to the Scottish economy, and they're the people we work for. Similar to Laurie's uh, organisation, we're also a supported business. Approximately 40% of our staff team, it's a much smaller organisation, but approximately 40% are people who would otherwise uh, really struggle to find work, and we have the skill set and that social capital to get them into work with us initially and then move them on into mainstream commercial support, uh, employers. I suppose maybe I could focus in, in, the question a bit more for, for Vicky Brock and for Professor McEwen. Um, what is it you want more of that would help you be more successful? So, you know, I've heard the value of social enterprises and I've heard Laurie say that trust and actually giving you more work um, is, is helpful, but, but is there anything institutionally you need more of that, that would help? Thank you. Um, yeah, everything that's been said so far is entirely true. The 
what motivates and drives a social enterprise can be quite different from a commercial enterprise. So, um, so I run a social enterprise which uh, delivers uh, business gateway across probably about a quarter of Scotland, uh, Scotland startups. Um, as, a, as an enterprise trust, we seek to, to create surpluses that we can then put back in to, f to fulfil our, our objective, which is really to make the economy much better. And so I think last year we had about 370,000 went back in, but that then unlocked over an, a million pounds of private sector money coming in to support startups too. And that, that recycling of wealth that happens within social enterprise is a really interesting thing. Structurally, what we need uh, more of is, is that belief that a social enterprise and its, its aims and objectives to, to do what it sets out to do and then possibly give back into a community and unlock more private sector support and engage a, a more collaborative uh, country is, uh, is something that doesn't really exist too much within the commercial world. And so I would say that you know to, to trust us to, to do the right thing is, uh, would be a, a wise thing to do. So I'm, I'm in a slightly different position in that I'm a, a serial entrepreneur. I'm, I'm, all of my experience has been entirely commercial. So I've, I've set up entirely commercial companies. I'm about to launch my fourth, um, which I have used the business model as I'm going forward, which is for profit, for good, because I was actually terrified of the concept of setting up a social enterprise. I couldn't understand how to make the business model work, and I applaud anybody that, that does. I didn't want my next business to be trapped in a loop of constantly needing to be raising money from potentially capricious sources or for sources that would change on a cycle that didn't map to my business. So I've spent quite a long time trying to figure out a business model where I can do what I want to do on the social good side from a what I feel is a slightly safer and therefore probably more understood to me business model where I make commercially sustainable money in a replicable way on a time frame I control and I deploy it over here. I suppose what would have made me more comfortable going, all right, I can set this up as a social enterprise is, is a very clear understanding of the financial mechanism and the time frame and the consistency of how long that support might be around for had I chosen to go that route. So financial certainty is yeah. the key issue for you. Sorry, Laura. Can I come back on, on the specific point about what I think the public sector and, and government could do more? Mm. Um, and it's about commissioning and procuring contracts. We bid for contracts in employability and skills, in justice and in sustainability. We compete against all the big companies whose names are now in the public um, env environment, with the exception of Carillion, but Capita, Interserve, who there's been uh, profit warnings about, Serco, G4S. We compete with those companies who run a number of contracts um, in Scotland and, and the wise group operates in the northeast of England as well as across Scotland. And there is no benefit that government sees in social enterprises against those companies. You could introduce much more demands on open book accountancy, accountability um, on measuring social impact, which we do and is often demanded by government rightly in our contracts. Many of these contracts are payment by results, so we have the same cash flow issues as people in the first panel talked about. It was a, a payment by results contract. The Scottish Government have just procured employability contracts that were devolved from the UK Government, and there is a cash flow element to that yep. that we get no extra help with compared with these large, mm -hmm. internationally owned, several billion pound turnover companies that are in our market. And I think there are better ways of commissioning and procurement. There's good examples. The Scottish Government has some good examples, and there's others mm -hmm. south of the border. But I think we need to learn about that across the public sector and about how we then uh, look at the track record and the type of companies that we are procuring to carry out services on behalf of the public sector. Right, I have um, a number of committee members who'd like to come in. I think, first of all, Gordon MacDonald, then Dean Lockhart. Um, 
Point carrying on from um, Jackie Bailey's question. And, uh, Laurie, you were talking about um, inclusive growth, etc. I mean, how do we ensure that every section of society benefits when there is economic growth? I mean, what would you see the steps that are necessary? I think that the kind of people that social enterprises will tend to work with mm -hmm. have um, other issues about their life other than being able to get straight into work. Um, relatively short-term unemployed people will get back into the labour market quickly yeah. because they're, they're used to working, they're motivated, they've got work experience, they've got a CV, they've got a track record, if you like. Um, we tend to come across a lot of people whose challenges could be health, confidence. It's not usually lack of skills, but sometimes it's the more softer skills of being able to, to work as in a, it, to cope with a working environment. They may have caring responsibilities, um, etc. So I think we've got to see individuals in a holistic way and resolve some of those issues in their lives before um, expecting them to be able to, to get into the economy. But they are essential because we are spending public money on supporting those individuals anyway. If we don't get them into the economy, then we'll continue to do that potentially throughout their lives. And there are various programmes that work. We tend not to spend a huge amount of money on the people with the greatest issues about getting into the economy. I, I benefited from higher education, but if you look at what an individual who comes out of school and goes into further or higher education will get from the public purse against an individual who comes out of school with no qualifications, um, it's, very, it's very small compared to, to, to the, the investment in further and higher education. And it's got too small, it's got too tight, I think. When I first started in the wise group about 12, coming up for 12 years ago, I think the amount of money on average we have to get a long-term unemployed person into work is about a third of what it was now, it's about a third now of what it was 10, 12 years ago. And that's relatively small. Okay, thanks so much. For me, for me is, uh, there's an element of uh, the robustness about social enterprise, which is encapsulated in this idea of uh, once you bring somebody who has got complex needs, somebody who has been out of work for a long time, who faces all the sort of things that Laurie alluded to there, and you bring them in to your organisation, although it may be harder in the short term that you face more challenges as an employer, um, that you, you will never get a more loyal member of staff, and you'll never get anyone who's more grateful for a job. I've had people sitting in my office telling me they would do anything for the grass market. It's a hugely privileged position to be in, uh, um, to, to have someone in your office saying that about you. And that's because you literally, in their view, saved them. You saved their life. And uh, that you, you won't get a harder working individual in terms of productivity, and you won't get somebody who's more willing to contribute to the growth of the Scottish economy than those people that will put their heart and their soul into the survival of an organisation and a business, a business model. So. That's one of the key contributions that social enterprise can make mm. to growth is including people. You're missing a trick if you don't include them because it's one of the most talented, hard-working individuals and you're missing a trick. I think it's really um, important to recognise that not everybody can afford to be an entrepreneur. Now, like, I kind of have this entrepreneur hat, do this whole startup thing. I work with startups from schools through to in incubators. Is a very narrow section of the population that can afford to work for a year for nothing on the hope that their idea might work. And that is the reality of it. You're, you're working 60, 70, 80 hours a week for an indefinite period, for no money, for something that might not work. And it's a very narrow little elite of people, which you know, as an educated person who's worked in tech, I am one of. And it's hard enough when people are li leaving a decent salary, you know, they're leaving a 40, 50 grand job to go do this startup adventure, that's hard. But if you've not, if you're in a position where to go and do that, you're not available for work if you're doing that. You are working full out, full time, on your idea that may not even become a business. You're not available to do anything else. And there, there is actually very, very few people outside the, the stereotypes, and to say which I'm one, that, that can afford to do that. And my kind of crazy idea is that, you know, I think that that first year when you are founding a company, that should be, that should be a minimally salaried job. That is an insane amount of work. Uh, provided you're in a structured environment, if you're, in a, if you're reporting into an incubator, you're sending your metrics back, you're showing up and you're doing the work, why the hell should that be something that you're supposed to do for free? 
Um, I don't know the mechanics of that. <laughs> so I'm fortunately not a politician, but I do think that that would massively open up the potential for other, pot other people to unlock their potential and found stuff and be entrepreneurs, because they have the skills. I'd agree entirely. And uh, uh, the, for a lot of our the people that we train up in our woodwork shop, for example, the natural step would be to make their own furniture. And there's a market for it. But trust me, there's a, definitely a market. We're, we're overwhelmed. And um, the, the, the difficulty would be for someone who has been unemployed for a significant period of time, comes and trains and volunteers with us, to go into that something as insecure as that. I mean, coming off benefits to go into something as insecure as that, even the benefit option's not the ideal option for any of those people. The, the thought of working flat out for very little money, not knowing when the next order is going to come through, not knowing how to manage your bookkeeping, all that sort of stuff, the kind of stuff that we can't do, um, it would be just terrifying to most. And it, Well, I know it is terrifying whenever we have these conversations with the members of the grass market. So I totally agree with you. I think self-employment, having been self-employed for five years, is for a lot of people overrated and mis misguided as an option for, and we have to be very careful about saying this is where everyone should be, self-employed, entrepreneurial, and everything. This is great for the right individual, but it's terrifying for a lot of people to go down that route. I think um, for, our, for modern businesses, the, the notion of fairness and equality being a, a luxury, I think we know now that it's, it's not, it's, it's actually crucial. It's reputationally, it's crucial apart from anything else, but if we get the fairness and equality part right, that gives us real productivity change. Um, because as employers, we need to we need to have people who are completely ingrained in our business. That we can attract the right people and retain them. And, and people don't hang around where they feel that there's an inequality or a lack of opportunity. Or And so a, a business that's founded upon um, greed or exploitation um, ain't going to get very far in these days because we have you know, high levels of employment now and people do have choices. Mm -hmm. And so they want to work in the right environment. And if they don't find that, they will move on. So it's no longer a luxury. We, inclusive, um, fair working practices is just a crucial part of today's business. But just on that point, we've seen um, an increase over the last couple of decades of the ratio between the lowest paid in an, in an organisation and the highest paid in an organisation actually growing. I mean, how do you address that issue? If you're saying people would walk if they don't see fairness and equality, yet in the background to that we're seeing that increase in ratio and a lot of people don't have a choice to walk. You know, they're in secure employment and the concern is if I want to support my family, I need that secure employment, regardless of what, what the, the salary level is. I think um, that the issue we've seen since since the downturn in 2008, so it's been a tough 10 years for business. It's been a very kind of unstable time where um, employees have... I mean, one of the, the key things for retention is that the employees feel both valued and invested in, and they feel secure in that employment. Um, and I think businesses have, in some ways, I think our growth has been stunted in the last 10 years quite significantly. So the, the chain reaction of people moving from the bottom up has has stalled in some way, and that the leaders have had to become, you know, much more robust and innovative in how they go about certain things. But there is a middle ground that, that has created a void. I think it will be something that will have a an impact soon with with automation taking over many of the somewhat more mundane tasks. Economically, I have I have no real answer to why that that divergence has happened. Um, but if, if that's seen as being an unfair, oppressive type of organisation, then ultimately, you know, that, that, will come, that will come through because there are too many organisations working cleverly now to, to ensure that that doesn't happen. This is actually an area where the social enterprise sector leads the way. It has mm. to be said that our, the ratios between our highest and lowest paid are significantly smaller. I think it's 1 to 2.5, if I'm correct, in the last social enterprise census, which is, you know, pales into insignificance in terms of the, the, the private sector's commitment to this ever-widening gap between the rich, the largest, the highest paid and the lowest paid in their organisation. So, you know, it, it's, we're leading the way in that sense. And we also have far more women, going back to your previous panel, in, in our organisations, heading up our organisations, working at all levels of our organisations. So we, we are leading the way in that kind of stuff, without any doubt. So we also have a, a, a voluntary code, it is, in, in Scotland, of signing up 
to a um, maximum of one to seven. I think it's the ratio between the lowest and highest paid. We sign up to that and we pay the living wage. And also we'll tend to have good conditions for staff. We have flexible working, flexible hours. We invest um, significantly in staff development and training. So that's part of the culture. And as, as Gary said, I, th I think that doesn't necessarily uh, only apply in this, the social enterprise world, but we do sign up to, to a voluntary code that, that has a maximum on the salary of the highest paid individual in, in, in line with, with the lowest paid. And I think that's something that businesses should be doing generally. Mm. It would be good to see that across the commercial sector, you know, signing up to some of these voluntary codes that we sign up to. You don't see as much of it. Um, it's almost like, um, you know, they don't feel they need to. You know, so they, you know, even that the fair tax voluntary code, which is just literally paying the taxes you're supposed to pay. You know, let's see more businesses shouting yeah. about the good things that they do, which they're supposed to do, and like less maybe concern themselves with CSR and all that kind of stuff. Let's just talk about the great things that they're doing because they have to, because um, it's good. Right. We'll move to a question from Dean Lockhart before coming to Kezia Dugdale. Thank, thank you. I just wanted to clarify what we mean by social enterprise, because there is a lot of terminology involved, CSR, etc. How, how, there's no legal definition, as I understand it, in Scotland of what a social enterprise is. How does the sector itself distinguish uh, what is a social enterprise and what is not? Is it driven by the voluntary code? Do you have to have signed up to the voluntary code in order to technically qualify to be a social enterprise? You don't have to, it's, it's a voluntary code, um, but many of us do. Most social enterprises are set up as companies limited by guarantee. Many have charitable status, that's the, the structure we adopt and have done since the Wise Group was formed 34 years ago, I think. Um, but there's also a, a legal model called a community interest company mm. that many adopt. I think the, the key to it is openness, transparency and accountability. So um, our, our mantra is that everything we do is, is open so people see a lot more about what we do. But there's, you're right, there's no specific legal definition of a social enterprise, but I would imagine the bulk of social enterprises are companies limited by guarantee with charitable status. Mm. I think the code is a step forward. Uh, um, um, whether you, whether you want to we would extend that and exclude groups or organisations that call themselves social enterprises that didn't sign up to the code. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not convinced. But it does give a really good definition about an asset lock for those who aren't familiar with the code, so that all your resources, all your assets are locked to, into a community benefit, and that you're not putting your profits into private uh, um, investment unless it's being reinvested in your business. It's really clear and cut and dry for me and my organisation. So. I don't see any reason not to do that, and especially if you're going to enjoy, which some of us do, financial incentives or uh, preferential treatment in terms of tax or grants or that sort of thing. It's good to have a, a robust definition mm. like that, um, gives transparency to, and, uh, to, to what you're doing. However, I'm totally for CSR. I'm totally for businesses that want to enjoy being part of a, a movement for fairer working practices and better ways of doing business, more inclusive ways of doing business, who don't want to call themselves a social enterprise. I'm totally, I mean, it's all about collaboration and working with all sorts of business models for me. Okay. You mentioned, I guess, grants, and I guess that might be one of the questions I was coming on to. When it comes to Scottish Enterprise or the Scottish Government, do they apply a particular definition or guidelines as to how you qualify for uh, funding or social enterprise assistance as, 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 a, as a social enterprise? Lots of social enterprises, including ours, get no grants at all. Mm. If we do get, uh, well, we can get a grant um, through the big lottery, but it's competitive um, grant maker, we don't get any, no, you know, we don't get any regular support through grant aid for our core activity, uh, and that's the general model. Uh, often, uh, charitable status is the criteria for grant making bodies, so trusts and the big lottery, for example, um, would want to see charitable status. Um, so, uh, there's, I think most social enterprises realise that the grant world is not sustainable and that they have to be able to uh, generate income either through competitive tendering and winning contracts or through customer facing activity, commercial activity. And the key is, as, as uh, I think Johnny and I and others have been saying, that, that what marks you out as a social enterprise is what you're doing 
and that there is an asset lock. So if you, yeah. you, we have to make a profit every year or we go out of business like any other business. But that asset is reinvested in the business and it doesn't, it doesn't go to shareholders or owners. And that's, that's the key difference. And my final question, are you comfortable not having a strict definition? Do you think it helps the sector having that flexibility rather than have a, a black and white definition of what a social enterprise might or might not be? I'm personally comfortable. I think we heard earlier in the first panel um, the Page and Park Architects model, which is an employee-owned company. Mm. I think um, there are different models around. Vicky's described other models. It, I don't think it matters. I think what matters is what you do and how you do it and that in Scotland we have an opportunity for different kinds of companies um, to play a role in, in generating a, a inclusive economic growth in, in Scotland. Um, I think there should be restrictions on some of the companies that are making excessive profits, particularly if they're running government contracts and particularly where that involves working with vulnerable people. So I do have a personal issue about some of the companies that get taken on by the UK and the Scottish Government to run employability programmes, for example that don't declare where their profits go and may be owned by investment companies that, whose main aim is to sell them on if they win a government contract. And that's a personal issue for me. But apart from that, I'm pleased uh, if a company has um, a model that, that cares about their people, their communities, their social impact and the environment. I think the general notion that a uh, social enterprise has the ultimate beneficiary of being the population of our country rather than shareholders is a, is a broad but very good one. Um, but it was mentioned earlier on, I think it's maybe worth reiterating, all of our income is commercial. Uh, we have to, to bid alongside many of these commercial organisations. And if Laurie may be the same, but when you look at the... Uh, we do a lot of stuff with the um, Scottish Government and SE. Um, when we apply the, uh, our tendering process, there's no notion of, of benefit to being a social enterprise. The weighting never seems to, even in a in a small way, tip its hat towards that notion that we're actually here for the benefit of Scotland, not for the benefit of, of shareholders. Um, and so I would, if there's one thing that could change, it would be nice if that was recognised when these contracts are being delivered, that what's actually happening to the, the surpluses here, where is it going and how is that unlocking other money within the sector? Um, Mm. And we know that these things are, you know, that they have to be economically competitive. We understand that, and we will always try and be. But where there's um, little difference, it should it should make a difference to the decision makers about where that money is going. The grant thing is interesting because my previous, most of the companies I've done have been data technology in some way, and and my next one is, so IP patenting is important, and I have leveraged. Um, R&D grants and smart awards and, you know, the shape of that type of company is the equivalent of winning the support lottery because you just tick everybody's box in every way, shape or form. And it was one of the things as I was thinking about how I was going to structure the next one. I didn't want to preclude myself from smart awards and all the assistance you get when you're building um, technology and when you're building IP by the way I'd chosen to structure the company. So I was, I was very wary of the term social enterprise full stop because I just thought that's going to rule me out of so much free money that I've leveraged so well before. Mm. I know that sounds ruthless. Sorry. <laughs> Apologise to all the, the non-evil people. <laughs> well, I think just point on this uh, um, idea of definition. I do, I do think there's a place for a shorthand. All of our businesses um, are customer facing, and um, it's really good, I think, for um, you know a bit like the fair trademark, which is now very well established. Everyone in the room would understand what the fair trademark. If you brought fair trade coffee, which hopefully you have, then uh, you understand the benefit of buying that instantly, yeah, and people can have a conversation about about that. And I think there is a place for uh, some kind of kite mark uh, or uh, you know. Um, easy way in, logo, whatever, you know, with a, obviously with a set of conditions attached, whether it's the code or whether it's something, that consumers can get an instant like-for-like -like cafe, for example, the Grass Market Cafe sits beside other cafes which aren't social enterprises. If you enjoy our cafe, which hopefully you will do at some point, you may well choose it on the basis that it's a decent coffee plus it has added benefit and same with Serenity and places like that. So, 
you know, where that, that kind of shorthand for consumers mm. to cut through some of this yeah. grey areas, I think would be really useful. I'm not suggesting for any one moment that should come from the Scottish Government necessarily. It might, maybe it'll be an industry thing, but, you know, I do think, or a sector thing, I do think it'll be useful. Okay. Right. I'm bringing Kezia Dugdale to be followed by Tom Arthur. Thanks, Kavina. I want to develop that point with you uh, in a second or so, but before we do that, I just go back to something Laurie said earlier. Laurie, ap apologies if I didn't catch this in the exact words that you used it, but I think you suggested that the amount of money that we spend um, on reducing long-term um, unemployment or people who furthest removed from the labour market is a third of what it was 10 years ago. I think you used the word we. Do you mean we, the government, we, Scotland? What does that mean and how did you get to that statement? Um, I was meaning, uh, as a, co a collective way, if you like, but through the public sector, contracts that are available for organisations like us to bid for, uh, in broad terms, um, we get around about £1,000 to work with somebody over a longish period of time to not just get them into work, but sustain them in work. Yeah. And the groups of people that, quite rightly, are being targeted are those people that have been unemployed for a longer period of time or who have health or other issues that affect their ability to get into work. Um, I believe that my, my experience in the WISE group is that that's about a third of what was available 10 years ago in similar kinds of contracts from government. That's really helpful clarification, Laurie. Thank you. But just going back to the more generic point about, um, you know, what constitutes good business, and you also mentioned earlier, Laurie, you know, the key to this is maybe cracking the procurement system and allowing a broader range of companies and organisations to access at least the Scottish government's procurement system. And again, reflecting on the evidence that I know most of you heard from our first panel, I mean, many of the things which constitute a good business, whether that be paying your bills on time, having community impact, being a good employer, uh, looking to employ young people, having a diverse workforce, they're all in the Scottish Government's business pledge. The, the ones that haven't been mentioned so far are things like uh, innovation and internationalisation. So what do you think of the Scottish Government's business pledge? Is that the platform, Johnny, for your kind of badged uh, mark? The, the, the fundamentals are already there. I'm just struck that, you know, only 15% of the government's current contractors uh, are signed up to the business pledge. Is this a model that works? If so, what more should be done uh, to promote it? Or if it's not working, what should replace it? Should it be mandatory? Just some reflections on the business pledge would be great. I, I, I support it and we sign up for it. And the most recent uh, tendering we did with the Scottish Government asked if we were signed up to the business pledge. I don't think there was enough due diligence done, um, so it's easy. A tender is like sitting in an exam. You fill in the form and it goes to somebody who scores it and a result comes out. There's no interview. for the, uh, the rarely interviews or what's called a negotiation, I suppose, over tenders. And I don't think um, we're doing enough around the business pledge. I think it could go further. It follows up Gavin's, uh, sorry, Gary's point about um, tendering. Tendering should look at the type of business you are as well as whether you've signed up to the pledge. It could include, for example, the ratio between the lowest and highest paid person. It could be open book accountancy. If you are making a profit, where is it going? We, the international business companies that bid for government contracts across the UK often are owned by US, Australian, whatever, and they're often equivalent of private equ equity companies, investment companies that will sell on those companies if they win sufficient government contracts. And you see that by just looking back at the ownership of all the ones that are in the news over the last 10 years or so. I don't think you, government, we, uh, uh, government either at a UK or Scottish level is doing enough to uh, determine what kinds of companies and the business pledge is a very good start, but I think it could go further. And yeah, I would make it mandatory. Comments from others? I totally make it mandatory. I mean, we didn't actually deliver any uh, gov government uh, contracts, um, and so we're in a different position. But I have tended before, and I'm really aware of how my uh, business, in terms of my business practices, stack up in terms of uh, the pledge much more than some of the others that maybe uh, are tendering for uh, uh, for that particular contract. I know for a fact they are in terms of where they're coming from and where they invest their money when they're not tendering for uh, local contracts. I also feel very strongly that so many local contracts, particularly around employability, and I'm sure you'll agree, Laurie, it's about relationships. It's about relationships. 
relationships, particularly with that complex needs group, the long-term unemployed, which is going to have a huge saving, a huge benefit to the Scottish economy long-term if you get them into work, um, then the relationships are held within these local organisations, often social enterprises uh, um, that are already doing the work. You know, so they should be given a much greater opportunity to participate in that tendering process, definitely. I think the, um, the multiplier effect you will get from government by procuring services from organisations who not only sign up to that but live to those values um, would be colossal. So I would have it mandatory too, but I'd make it count. There's always that. There's a saying that uh, you know, what gets measured gets done. So if you make that a measure within the tendering process about how well you shape up against those criteria, then uh, you'll get much more value for the, the money that's been spent because we're, we'll become more productive, we will be, become more inclusive. Um, and I think it would be it would level, level the playing field a little bit more against organisations that um, are very much driven by commercial shareholding. So. You said earlier, Gary, that you might give weighting to social enterprises within the procurement system or within the tendering system. Is that your preferred model to making it the business pledge? Because, of course, if you make it the business pledge, it's, it's broader um, in terms of the number of private companies that could sign up to, but it might have further reach. And just, I, I'm aware that not everybody will be familiar with the contents of the business pledge. I've studied it a lot in the last 24 hours, but just for everybody's benefit, you there are nine qualifying elements to the business pledge, but in order to sign the pledge, you only need to be doing two. You just need to commit to do the rest of it over a period of time. So it shouldn't be that um, difficult for a, a larger number of companies, particularly ones the government's already funding, to sign up to that pledge. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. The, these are these values that you um, talked about there are, are crucial, whether it's a commercial organisation or a social enterprise. And we should be doing that stuff. And, and you shouldn't be engaging with organisations that don't. Absolutely. Um, I think the, the status of a social enterprise, of, of, ha of what exactly happens to the, the money, is something that should be almost separate from that to say, OK, if all things were equal, if we had two organisations that were compliant with all nine of these uh, pledge items, then let's go with the social enterprise, because at least then there's, there's an additional value being created. Uh, but yeah, every, every organisation who you engage with should be active in those, those areas. If there's um, an underpinning framework within the data collection, so if, if data is disaggregated as you're capturing it, so gender and social markers are being exposed in the ongoing data that you're capturing, you can actually get to a place where you can measure the social return on, uh, the social return on investment a little more easily. Now, that's massively complex, but if the basic underpinning of data capture is a little bit more robust than it is now, you would be able to more consistently measure social return on investment, which means you could more consistently weight into the procurement process what is the potential social return on investment from this bid. Um, and underneath all of that, it's, it's accurate, boring, consistent data capture and exposing the granularity in that data. Right, thank you. And now Tom Arthur, and to be followed by John Mason. Thank you very much, convener, and good morning. Um, my questions relate back to some of the um, some matters discussed earlier, following Jackie Bailey's line of questioning, and particularly around capacity building for social enterprises. I am um, fortunate. In my own constituency of Renfrewshire South have some fantastic examples. There's the Local Energy Action Plan based in Loch Winner who do a lot of great work in supporting the uptake of um, renewable energy um, sources, energy efficiency, active travel, and called Barkin as the old library centre, which has taken a former Liberal club and converted it into an excellent community facility. And in Newston, there's the Newston Development Trust who a really outstanding example took over um, a bank about 12 years ago, converted it into a cafe. It's now a, um, a, a centre of excellence for cycle repair. It's a cycling hub. Newston um, and Upland Moor first responders are based there and, de and indeed they were involved with um, Newston Community Wind. They've had about a 28% stake which they recently shared generating £2 million surplus which are now going to be able to invest in a, in a charity community fund. So they're really fantastic examples but I know from speaking to other social enterprises in my constituency there can be some challenges there. Um, challenges around capacity building um, and also a sense that people can feel when they can 
the process, I suppose, of heuristic learning can get them to their goals eventually, but then perhaps with more support, we could expedite that journey. So I'm just wondering, do you think the support is there um, to an, enable, uh, to allow social enterprises to flourish in Scotland? And in, in particularly as well with relation to a kind of, a, I suppose, shared desire for greater community empowerment, certainly the ideals are there, but have those ideals actually been translated into the support on the ground? Um, my, my view is that there is a significant amount of support. It's a similar um, response to the one that you got at the first panel, I, th I suspect. There is a bit of duplication. Some of the support and some of the advice that new businesses or new social enterprises will get will be relevant, some, some less so. Um, there's a, there's a, a model in Scotland of um, supporting startup social enterprises through an organisation called Firstport that I suspect some of the ones you've just talked about in your constituency will go through. Um, and there are other supports that come on. Come on. I don't believe that Scottish Enterprise understands social enterprise. We were account managed by Scottish Enterprise for a while. We had a, an individual that did, it, did understand us and we got some good support. We got passed on to somebody else that we were just, we were a, for, a box ticking exercise for them. So we, we no longer are account managed by Scottish Enterprise. There's funding around through social investment models. Sometimes it's quite expensive. And for larger social enterprises like ours, it doesn't go high enough. Um, we haven't, we would get a better rate through the commercial lending than we would through the social investment uh, models. I think south of the border, there are more creative ways of funding social enterprise, again, particularly larger ones and more innovative ones. But on the whole, there's quite a, a broad support mechanism. But also, critically, social enterprises support each other. In almost every local authority, you'll find there's a local social enterprise network, and there's Social Enterprise Scotland at a Scotland-wide level that, that um, provides information and support. Organisations like ours, the Wise Group, I, I maybe said earlier that we employ something like 240 people at the moment. In the contracts that we run, we have formal agreements with over 100 smaller organisations uh, to help deliver those contracts. And that is a model that we use for almost every contract we have, a partnership model that will allow organisations that deliver specialist services or particularly local services to take part in a contract that they wouldn't be able to bid for on their own. And we think we've created around 200 jobs in the last um, 10 years amongst organi smaller organisations that are working with us. So if we get a contract, it won't just be jobs in the wise group, it will be jobs in those organisations that help us deliver it. And that's, that's an important element of how social enterprises will work and support other social enterprises to grow and develop. Uh, I, mean, uh, I think you're absolutely right. There is definitely a challenge around capacity, particularly I mean, I'm, we're a small, much smaller uh, social enterprise. My previous social enterprise was smaller still. And um, <coughs> the, the, some of the talk earlier on around you know, scale up and stepping up and all this sort of investment stuff, it frightens the hell out of a lot of uh, board members and social enterprises and charities, you know, taking on investment loans and that sort of stuff. It's not a culture um, because people are very genuinely worried about the impact it'll have on some of the small communities and people just like a, um, a, an entrepreneur in the commercial sector put their heart and soul into whatever enterprise it is and will do everything for it to succeed. So they very get very anxious about, you know, that kind of thing. So capacity is definitely an issue. And that's why I would encourage um, Scottish Government and anyone really who's in a position to make a difference to to invest much more in those individuals, especially when they're that kind of young stage of with an innovation, a social innovation or an idea. There's fantastic organisations like Melting Pot in Edinburgh, um, you know, incubators. These these are the organisations because we should be investing as much as possible in those individuals rather than um, getting too um, embroiled in decision by committee and to risk averse boards and stuff these are the people that should be bringing forward these these new social innovative ideas so that that helps a lot with capacity because it comes down to those individuals driving the downside of that of course is you've got succession issues when those people move out of that community or out of that job to their next business the, the social enterprise can really struggle 
because it's displacement because that key individuals moved on so about, so that's where you may put in some additional support but I totally agree with Laurie there's a lot of support out there and I, I totally agree with the panel earlier on as well that it's cluttered I noticed someone used that word that's exactly the word that I would use um, you sometimes you have to navigate your way you get advice from this person to go to this organization you go to them and they say oh we don't work with startups and you go oh really the networks are where I got predominantly my support with my adventure and, and continue with Grass Market. That's why, why I sit on the board of Edinburgh Social Enterprise Network, because it's that kind of uh, uh, mentoring that we provide for each other. I do a lot of uh, paid and unpaid collaboration um, with other social enterprises. There's, it's a wonderful culture. It's much less competitive, in my view, uh, in the um, commercial sector where we look after each other, where we help each other, where we maybe share training, maybe share facilities in a way that's maybe not felt so much in the in the wider commercial sector. I don't know what you, you think. But. I think the sector is possibly not that different from the, the commercial sector. I mean, a social enterprise is very much like an enterprise of any other kind. Uh, perhaps the beneficiaries ultimately may be different, but its ability to become established, build a reputation, build credibility and grow and be sustainable, they will face this, the very same challenges that entrepreneurs do when they start um, commercial businesses. So we see, I mean, when you, when you have someone with huge amounts of passion and, you know, no stranger to hard work and dedication and resilience, you have the, the embryo of, of a social entrepreneur as much as you do any entrepreneur. Um, and that will always get the business going, whatever form it is. The, the skills and attributes that are required to be, become uh, growth orientated or um, or sustainable uh, are actually quite different because that passion will, will get will get you so far but it doesn't get your own way you know you have to bring in structure you have to bring organization um, and it, be it becomes a whole education process and if we can intervene in in any way it's to provide the interventions to convert these very passionate entrepreneurs into skilled people who, are, who have the capability of creating great social enterprises that will be around for a long time, uh, giving back to their communities. One more, some conscious of time. Just um, as a supplementary to the previous conversation about the Scottish Business Pledge and the Fair Work Agenda, I just wonder if the panel have any direct experience of the Carer Positive Employer Accreditation Scheme And in just in terms of um, what experience you have in terms of um, employees who are working carers and what support and, uh, you put in place for them, if the panel can potentially comment on that. We've, we've a flexible hours and flexible week system that any employee can um, ask to be considered to do their work within hours that would suit their family life or outside work life if they have caring or other responsibilities. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we react to an individual. We, we promote that within our organisation. It's um, sometimes um, I think working in a, an organisation isn't just about what you're paid, although mm -hmm. that's absolutely critical. So we are signed up to living wage. But it's also what other benefits you will provide as an employer to mm -hmm. individuals. And I think one of the main ones that staff uh, feedback that they like is flexibility around um, their daily working hours uh, within within a, a structure and their working week so they can do compressed hours or they can ask for time off. People can ask for temporary time off if there's a temporary issue uh, that they're dealing with and, and a caring issue sometimes is. I would say that uh, as an SME, it's 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 an area around flexibility, in particular where you know where you're customer facing, where you face huge challenges. Um, um, it's all well and good for us to say so you know you be as a fair employer as possible and support all your staff and whatever kind of issue that they're dealing with and etc cetera, etc. Cetera. But commercially, that can make it very challenging if you don't have people turning up for work for childcare reasons or caring reasons or whatever you've still got to serve coffee, you've still got to run a business. It's just exactly the same challenge as any other SME, we have exactly the same challenge. So it is very difficult. Like Laurie, we promote it, 
it's part, also part of our living wage uh, um, accreditation to commit ourselves to fairer working practices, more inclusive working practices. But in reality, that can be very challenging for an organisation like us. Um, well, we, we get around it by using social capital, using a lot of volunteers to help prop up the business when it's struggling. And also we have a lot of, you know, someone might work in one part of the business and then move into another part where, where we can still, you know, support them. So we're very lucky we have that, those options. But for a lot of SMEs, including us on a bad day, it's a huge challenge to, to be as flexible and support, a supportive employer as you'd like to be. As a startup, a tech startup, flexibility was one of the few things we could compete on um, because I was employing a lot of people who potentially could go and work for JP Morgan in Glasgow if they wanted to, um, but they, they didn't. Uh, or, or they may have many things in their life which meant they couldn't. So I, I actively recruited from returners to work and I actively recruited um, for... Um, people who perhaps who had not been as engaged with uh, work because they were on the Asperger spectrum, autism spectrum, because that, that, that was somewhere where I could really build a good team. And that, was, that worked extremely well until I had raised a certain level of money and now I was one of five board members and I was no longer the majority shareholder of my company and I was answering essentially to the people that were, were funding the company and these nice little fluffy things were a distraction and that was a huge mistake on their part of course because I feel that very much damaged our growth potential. It, it broke one of the reasons we were working but it was it was viewed as a indulgence which is a really sad thing a quick follow-up from Gillian Martin before we come to John yeah, this Mason's is something that question. I was hoping to get into in, in the previous panel as well because productivity has been talked about in uh, and the, it was been talked about in such terms as like the amount of hours worked but what you've just said there is that productivity is a lot more than that and that's about actually getting the best out of your employees flexible working hasn't been mentioned particularly boldly so far what you're just talking about uh, the ability to work remotely flexibly to fit in with other people do you feel that that's a productivity issue or is it just a socially conscious issue do you think there's actually a, a value to that uh, I, I felt there was a huge value to that so I, I had teams that just functioned on completely different body clocks to me and to many people and I I wasn't forcing people to work late but you know, there were individuals who did their best work after their kids had gone to bed sat down and then did four hours flat out now I was not expecting them to be answering an email before lunchtime um, it worked. It took a lot of people management on my part. It was a bit flight control because, you know, <laughs> sometimes you just need to get something out of the door and have everybody doing the same thing at the same time. And that is a challenge with flexible. But if you, if you have it at the heart of your culture, you actively recruit for it, people get more done in the four hours that is their four hours of being in the zone than they do locking them in a fluorescent lit office for And that has hours. an impact on the bottom line of a company. Yeah, absolutely. Because so if, people, if people are getting the most out of people in four hours and you've got a small, tight team that are operating really well together, you, you are getting the same amount done, but sometimes the measures are different. So you know, often more people is looking like an indicator of growth. You know, if, we've, if we double our workforce, like clearly we're doing great. Well, not if we don't produce any more. Um, so, the, you know, the measures can be funny. It, it depends whose success criteria you're working towards. And, and I certainly think that flexibility was at the heart of our fastest, best, most economically productive work in that it was the most profitable work as we got more expensive people and more traditional hours and structure mm. our 
for our profitability fell, our, our productivity fell, actually. So, so in terms of business up. support, do you think that that has to be recognised more, that that is a, is a measurement, could be a measurement that would actually increase productivity of companies across the board so that more companies would actually see the benefit of this as you have? Yeah, I, I think so. And I don't think it takes a lot of, I don't think it takes a lot of training for a manager or, or a company leader to get their head around that. I think, I mean, I'm a data-driven person, so I'll always show me the numbers, show me the output. If it works, I love it. If it doesn't work, I'll try something else. So you know, for me, it, it is super important to measure that. Um, but there's quite, I mean, I wouldn't take it too far. At one point, I, I had an initiative where people started tracking their hours, and that was just, that was just pointless. It, it, it undid the... It undid whatever the magic was. Okay, thank you. Thank you, John Mason. Okay, I think I've got question two. Uh, the, um, the next 10 years, I mean, if we can widen it out a bit, how do you see from your angle, how do you see the Scottish economy going in the next 10 years? But I'm also happy to hear how you, s you see it going for social enterprises uh, or whatever. What are, the, what are the challenges, what are the risks, what are the opportunities? You know, I, I, I have to say Brexit, but I don't I quite know how, in what way, I don't know enough about the Scottish economy and, and about the I impact of Brexit, but it, it, it scares me. Um, um, it scares a lot of my team, some of whom are from Europe um, and um, enjoy working in Scotland. So I have concerns about Brexit, and it's just a complete gap of knowledge for me. So that's uncertainty about your workforce, Yeah, that's uncertainty, basically. yeah. And yes. also, we enjoy uh, EU volunteers. We have funded EU volunteers uh, through a, a Erasmus scheme, and um, we really we love having them in our team. They come fully funded uh, through the uh, um, European community. They, they're, they're basically residential in Edinburgh and a full-time worker, and they're of really high quality. These are often students in between their degrees and going into work, so they've got maturity about them and stuff. So that we'll lose that. I can only presume we'll lose that after Brexit. So there's some real practical things about how we tap into that uh, or, or loop what we do once we lose that resource. But there's also the fact that the vast majority of my cafe customers are from Europe as well. Um, they, they flock to Edinburgh, it's a great city, and uh, they're tourists and they come into our cafe and we're customer facing. And we've created 11 new jobs in the last three years just from that cafe, just from a contract we have with local tour guides, predominantly serving the Spanish uh, community. So it's been a huge partnership with that commercial organisation to develop that, and they are scared as a as an international tour company that's bringing Spanish people out about the impact of Brexit. Um, so that's definitely an uncertainty in terms of sort of social enterprise and broader issues. Um, the, the 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 there is this uh, um, concern that was mentioned earlier on about definitions and about um, commercial organisations. Uh, peddling or suggesting that they're social enterprises when they're not and it making it a bit unclear for consumers and it being a bit, you know, uncertain. And in, in that uh, culture of uncertainty, we can all stop buying from social enterprises because we can not trust it. So there's an element of trust around the label social enterprise that that is something that I would like to see addressed in the next five, ten years. So there's a bit more clarity about if you're a social enterprise, just like Laurie's saying, you're open. Here is what we, here is how we spend the money, the profits from our from our enterprise. That's that's critical for me. Um, I think that's the main the main areas for me. Isn't it? Okay. To On the last um, ten years, we have a we have a Scottish government target of ten thousand new businesses supported each year. Um, it's been that number for a long time. My organisation, Elevator Sports, almost a quarter of them, and we see a very vibrant entrepreneurial culture around certainly our areas. I don't know if that's universal across Scotland. Um, but on travelling around um, the world, we find that the, the most vibrant economies um, have a trademark, which is, is such a vibrant startup community. The, the two seem to go very hand in hand. If you, if you create a very vibrant startup culture, then it's a, a signifier of a healthy economy. And I, I think in many ways we have achieved um, over the last 10 years on that front. I think where we have bigger issues is around how many of those organisations go on to grow to any significant degree. We have a, we have a growth um, issue. We seem to sell our businesses quite early by comparison to many other economies. We, we seem to have a, a fear of heights in that respect. Um, 
whether it's a lack of, we don't have too many people in, in this country who have experience of growing global companies. And therefore that, that means that the sort of slight immaturity of our entrepreneurs means that we, we, we get out while we can, while the going's good, which is often too early. Um, so we don't have quite as much issue around growth than we do around scale up. I see the two as being actually quite different. The ability to grow a company, the ability to scale it are, are two different things. We have big issues around scale, um, which we need to you know, think seriously about addressing. But in terms of the opportunities, there are lots of them around. If you, the, there was a recent uh, study of the CEOs of the Fortune 500 in the States, and three quarters of them had said that their biggest fear and challenge was the rapid pace of technology change. Um, they realised that 90% that of the Fortune 500 from 50 years ago isn't there anymore. And they reckon that in the next 10 years, 40% of those there now won't be there. And so the, the ability to disrupt markets with technology has never been greater. And so our current entrepreneurs have... Can I ask, is, is, that, is that more of a challenge for social enterprises and that kind of business? Or is it, do they just face exactly the same question? I think commercially... If we, when it boils down to the businesses that we, we run as social enterprises, they are, to all intents and purposes, the, the exactly the same challenges, um, possibly even more so around investment, because investment into a social enterprise when there's no out, outcome is, is, is difficult. But we, we, have a, we have a challenge in Scotland around how we, how we get a little bit bigger and how we challenge more on a global stage. Um, but technology has the ability to do that like never before. Enterprises tend in, in the whole to be people-based businesses, whether it's startups working with people to to start up businesses or or to, to include individuals in, in the economy or, or to tackle um, environment environmental issues. So yes, we're we're not immune to any of the, the, the global factors that will hit any business, but maybe a bit less directly affected by technology change. Um, a lot of our customers are people, the people that we work with are, you know, we talk about a digital divide, they're still away behind the people around this table in terms of their use of technology. We, yet we expect everybody now on benefits, or not everybody, but we expect a very high proportion of people on benefits to be doing that online. And a lot of our customers don't have the capacity to do that. They don't have the equipment, they're not attached to the internet, they're maybe on their phone, but. So there are big challenges still, I think, with a group of people in our society that we need to integrate into, into the economy in a way that, that expands who, who takes part in the economy in Scotland and makes it more inclusive. Just quickly, looking back over the last 10 years, then looking forward, I'm an optimist. I think we've come a huge way in the last 10 years in terms of social enterprise. We didn't really use that term 10 years ago. We were starting to think about social enterprise, in other words, putting the economic and social part of Scotland together. And so we've at least, we, we know what, I think we know what we're doing now. We've got an understanding of, of that. It's a business, it's a professional business. We're just as good as any other business where we're, we're, we're quality social enterprises and can compete. We can beat, and we have beaten people like Serco to win contract business uh, contracts. So it is possible, and it's not just us, there's, there's others can do that. But I still think we need, we need to go further and we need to move quicker because there are still a lot of people in Scotland excluded from any quality of life that we expect to enjoy if the economy is doing well. And I think that's, that's still a challenge for us and still going to be a challenge for the Scottish Government over the next 10 years. I think to build on that, obviously, from, from a slightly different perspective, because I don't have the social enterprise background, it, it is absolutely going to be a structural disruption driven by technology, particularly around rapid and repeat decision-making type tasks and repetitive tasks. That will... The driver behind so many sectors will be to automation and machine learning first to many of those things, which means that some of the sect sexier sectors right now that get support will actually become really commoditized. I mean, data tech and AI and, 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 and IT, a lot of that will become a automated machine 
task in itself, which is interesting because it means... It has to be said that coffee yeah. seems to take more people to make a cup now than it used well, to. Well, this is the interesting <laughs> thing, right? So it's all the undervalued sectors, hospitality, care, tourism, all of these things are actually the ones that will be least automated and they will be the place where human value will be really, really important. And they are the ones that right now are the least sexy, the least supported, and um, the least on anybody's agenda to try to, hey, let's make sure that we're developing more experienced businesses and more hospitality businesses and more care businesses because they're perceived as low value. I think that will shift because they will become higher value. Okay, uh, I think there'll be some of my colleagues will be going into that a bit more because that's an interesting area. Thanks, convener. Thank you. Um, further questions? Any further questions from committee members? Jamie Halko Johnson. Yeah, thank you very much, Kavita. Um, it, it was uh, actually a question about the sectors that um, uh, social enterprise are involved in. Uh, what are the kind of are there are there strong growth se sectors, particularly or areas that you think um, there is a lot more potential for social enterprise to have an involvement in? And also regionally, I represent the Highlands and Islands. Are there particular regions of Scotland where actually where the nature, remoteness, rural communities, etc., there's more potential as well for um, social enterprise to deliver services or deliver kind of local business? The, the, the recent um, uh, social enterprise center, census found that actually that's where a lot of social enterprises are doing very well in the rural communities, mm -hmm. but that might not necessarily be out of any choice because mm -hmm. it might be about saving a, 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 a local shop or a local pub or facility of some sort of kind or providing childcare after school clubs, that kind of thing. So they're, they're, it, uh, it's definitely a growth area in terms of social enterprise in the rural communities, but not necessarily for the most positive reasons because everybody else has left. Um, but, um, that, but that it's great. And the other thing that, that you're asking there about um, the particular sectors, my understanding, again, um, is that social care and in health care is where you'll see significant growth in social enterprise. Again, not necessarily for the right reasons. So although I am an advocate and a strong proponent of social enterprise in all its forms, uh, yet I, I, I would want, always want it, it, the public sector to be considered uh, as one of the best providers of public services. Um, considered, you know, where a social enterprise can genuinely, authentically provide a fantastic, better service in the public sector, then bring it on, and we do often do that. However, that I do think it's really important that some uh, services are not put out to tender and that public services are remain in the public sector, personally. So I wouldn't want to see too much in that growth in that area, but that, especially if it's motivated by saving money, and that's the sole motivation to put that particular service out for tender, and then a social enterprise is going to fall into the same trap as any other commercial organisation, they're going to go in, drive the price down, and provide less of a service. So some things cost money, for the right reasons and should be left. There's also perhaps a, a flip side uh, to that because we very often the role of government and local government is uh, is to is to really engage the private sector and perhaps in the context of this the social enterprises to be able to fulfil some of the some of the roles. It's not government's uh, place to do everything. There are things which we are perhaps more. Um, got more capacity and knowledge to be able to deliver, uh, and you know there are there are times when some things are delivered, conversely to what you just said, by local authorities that aren't best delivered by them, when they would be they would get much better value. But you know there is a, a certain amount of retreating back to local local authorities because of austerity, and because of the preservation of work within the, within a local authority, which is uh, a bit worrying. Um, when in fact social enterprise could be engaged to do it um, much more cost effectively and perhaps better. It shouldn't be ideologically driven, that's for me, and it shouldn't just be about price driven. That's, that's the key, because I, I totally agree. I mean, social enterprises have uh, delivered some fantastic services that would have been provided previously by the public sector, and we do a better job in the certain um, services, but we have to be very cautious about going down that route of just replacing public services tendering them out and then either the private sector or the social enterprise sector coming in and providing them more cheaply. If we're doing a better job, that's great, but let's be careful. I think the, the growth in the ability for the private sector and social enterprises to work in partnership more um, 
I don't particularly like the term corporate social responsibility. I prefer community benefits where the private sector, I think, have an opportunity to work with us much better to help them deliver some of their objectives in a way that um, I think is, is in line with the, the business pledge and in line with what government wants to see and where we can potentially get um, the benefits of, of where the private sector have got expertise and where social enterprise has got expertise working together. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Gillian Martin. Uh, hopefully a very short question, but um, the Scottish Investment Bank, what do you think that could mean to social enterprises? What would you like to see that mean to social enterprises, given that you've, you've made Time and time again, you've, you've talked about what you save the public purse. Do you think that, that some assistance from a Scottish investment bank could, could help you do more? It needs to start with a recognition that um, the social impact and saving the public purse is something that the government wants to purchase, whether it is through the, uh, the investment bank, the Scottish investment bank, or not. And I'm not sure that we've quite got to that stage yet. I'm not sure that that's legitimised as a way of investing in something that benefits uh, the public sector. Mm -hmm. And it, there's, there's very obvious examples. Justice is probably the most obvious one, where, in my view, 60% of people in prison are there because their behaviour is bad and we haven't worked out a better way of dealing with them. And they come out of prison no better able to cope in society than they, in fact, usually worse off than when they started. Yet if that investment was getting, and they're usually young males, if, if we were to invest in that group of people's uh, training, workability, getting them into work, supporting them for a while, whether it's to set up businesses or do different things, because often they're entrepreneurial, then we would be saving the public purse huge amounts of money and benefiting families and communities. Now, you can start to put a price on that, but if that's the kind of thing that we could invest in through an invest Scottish investment bank, then absolutely, I think it would be brilliant. So, but I think we're a couple of steps away from that. Yeah. Okay. The Scottish Investment Bank was absolutely transformational for us receiving that. I mean, each round we did, we were getting match funding. They were a useful guide to us in our business. And you know, the, the, the value absolutely was core to me being located here and locating my businesses here. And it, it's, it's a shame, you know, if, if there's a whole swathe of equally commercial entrepreneurial businesses who are excluded from that because it was it was fuel and it was a bit of guidance and you need that to you and I think it's one of the things that of all you look at all of the areas of, of, of Britain nobody else is doing anything like that to that degree there's London Angel co-investment fund and, and a few bits and pieces like that but there's really nothing in the way that it's been benefiting the early stage companies. Because the high street banks, we heard in a previous session, have kind of taken a step back from investing, from, from uh, yeah. supporting small businesses, we've heard. Four years in, we got a £30,000 loan for which my chairwoman and I had to put our houses on the line to guarantee that. And we had a £100,000 invoice waiting payment. Um, so that was as low risk as it came, and that's the one uh, one of the few startups I know who ever got bank loan, and boy, that was stressful. Mm. Um, the guarantee that came with that. I think SIB was a, a real revelation when it it was so needed when it was uh, when it brought into force, and it's done a, amazing work with so many businesses in Scotland. But as with the usual, uh, you know, it's what gets measured for things that's done. They're, they're chasing. You know, investments where there's a return to be made, then that's what they'll do. Uh, until they get directive from government level that the social impact of businesses is also important, then it's hard to see how they will orientate themselves towards taking that sector seriously. Okay. Earlier on, but there, is, there is quite a few uh, social investment funds now available to social enterprises which we're currently looking at for a development that we're involved in. And um, they are, they're, they're good, um, th but they aren't the cheapest. So that would be a big issue for me. And that would be a big barrier for us looking at investment from the, the Scottish Investment Bank would be about the level at which that investment is. And again, like Gary says, if it's tied to 
huge economic targets and you know that kind of financial stuff and ignoring the social benefit stuff then we wouldn't be able to give it a look in in the same way that we can with some of the other uh, investment social investment funds like social investment scotland and people like that who who big up the importance of that in the kind of business model thank you all right um if there are no further questions from committee members um uh, thank you very much to our witnesses and to the panel for coming in today and i'll now suspend the session and move into private session <laughs>